uh, join you guys, even if uh, uh, virtually. Um, and I'm going to be, it's going to be a, a, a very, very informal talk. So um, uh, as you'll see, well, I'll be talking about at least a few ideas that are sort of very preliminary and very speculative. Um, uh, so it's all in a very, very informal spirit. Please um, feel free to interrupt and ask questions at uh, any time. Um, but I want to mention uh, a few new thoughts uh, about the uh, hierarchy problem. Uh, those of us who thought about physics beyond the standard model for uh, decades now, um, know that thinking about the hierarchy problem has been the one sort of fundamental driving sort of theoretical question in the subject for a long time. And the fact that the, the physics results uh, from the LHC so far uh, really run counter to a sort of four decade paradigm for what we might uh, have expected to see is I think one of the great surprises in, uh, in fundamental physics of the last century. I think the sort of last time something analogously surprising happened uh, surprising in a sense that sort of most of the field uh, was a little over 100 years ago when the ether was not discovered. Um, uh, so uh, I think it's a, it's a good time when, when sort of deep problems like this are not solved the way people expected them to be. Uh, the problems don't, didn't go away, they just got more challenging and, and more interesting. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's a good time to, to uh, take stock and, and think again about sort of different uh, possibilities for what might be going on with the hierarchy problem and the cosmological constant problem. Um, uh, uh, and I'll, uh, both, both together. Okay? And um, maybe before starting though, I want to make a, a comment that there's kind of a, a narrative that um, uh, which is along the lines of really what I said that, uh, you know, theorists were totally sure that we'd see some natural new physics at the LHC, like supersymmetry, uh, probably. And then it was only when experiment came along and banged us over the head that, uh, um, that, uh, uh, that uh, we are starting to sort of abandon that picture or question that picture or something. That's a kind of common narrative. And I think it's a narrative that's uh, that's not really true um, uh, in the sense that there are many theorists, certainly including me, but definitely not just me, uh, but uh, not, a, not a sizable majority of people, but definitely a sizable minority of people uh, that long before the LHC, we're talking about something strange with the sort of basic naturalness paradigm. Um, and we all know what the sort of, uh, what, the, what the challenge was that of course any idiot could say, well, maybe naturalness is right, maybe naturalness is wrong. And that, that sort of philosophical argument was not, uh, uh, you could take either point of view. Uh, the reason for taking naturalness seriously was because it appeared that taking it seriously gave us these successes, especially in the context of supersymmetry. It gave us these extra quantitative successes of the supersymmetric uh, unification of gauge couplings, as well as more qualitatively, the sort of picture of WIMP Dark matter that uh, that, uh, that that was produced with you know roughly the right uh, uh, relic abundance, and um, so those were the sort of concrete successes of taking the sort of naturalist point of view seriously. Uh, but almost from day one, almost from sort of 1979, 1980, 77 to 80, when people first started thinking about uh, uh, naturalness as a, a motivation to go beyond the standard model, there have been counterindications. And the counterindications began with if there's all this stuff at the weak scale. Uh, why haven't we seen flavor chain neutral currents, electric dipole moments, uh, um, uh, other indirect indications for their presence? And at first, of course, early on, this was taken not as a problem, as an, as an opportunity that the physics at, uh, at the TV scale had to have sort of very particular structure in order to avoid those problems. But as time went on and those signals we, we didn't see them as we pushed the, the accuracy more and more and more. And as well, we didn't see the, for example, super partners and accelerators. Uh, the difficulty with supersymmetry did not begin with the LHC. It began with LEP. Um, it began with LEP because supersymmetry is a theory for the weak scale. Uh, by all rights, should have had, you know, electroweak genomes and sleptons somewhere around the Z mass, um, not 10 times the Z mass at the TEV scale. Um, so, the, the, so there have been counterindications almost from day one that were sort of getting worse and worse and worse, um, slowly, but always uh, uh, moving in, in one direction uh, monotonically. And so that, at least in my mind, was a sort of challenge that, that the sort of tension in the subject of, uh, of uh, indications in two opposite directions. And for me, at least, 
the attention was uh, resolved with the with the discovery of the picture of minimal split Susie. Uh, and so that has been my own best bet for what's going on at the TV scale, really since 2004, 2005, when uh, when uh, uh, when uh, 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 we first started talking about these ideas. Remember, here the the picture of minimal split Susie is that the scorch and leptons are a loop factor heavier than the electroequinos um, and the and then the gauginos and perhaps the hexinos. Uh, the fermions of the spectrum are nailed to be somewhere near the TeV scale because they're supposed to be dark matter. Um, but the theory is tuned. It's finally tuned because the scorch and leptons are at 100 or 1,000 TeV. And when I first went around giving talks on the subject, people literally yelled at me uh, because of the heresy that we we're talking about a theory that was supersymmetric and fine-tuned at the same time, with a tuning of about a part in 10,000 to a part in a million in the conventional way of thinking about the tuning is for electroweak symmetry breaking. But of course, the response to this was that uh, even supersymmetric theories have a, a tuning of at least a part in 10 to the 90 for the cosmological constant. So whatever high horse you're getting on for tuning cannot be that high because it's uh, bludgeoned by the massive tuning associated with, uh, uh, with the CC. Anyway, this is not a talk about uh, uh, split Susie, which is a, a very old subject, but I, um, I, I just want to say that th this is certainly a picture of the world that uh, uh, that uh, if you had put a gun to my head in the middle of the night and asked what I think is going on, this is what I think is going on. This is what I think, uh, think has been going on since the mid-2000s. In this picture, we have the simplest picture of, uh, in, this, in this framework, we have the simplest uh, picture of WIMP dark matter. It's just electroweakinos or hexenos that are between one and three TeV. That's what they have to be in order for the relic abundance to come out, right? This is not made at the LHC and for very good reasons has tiny direct detection cross section. So, so if there's a very good reason we haven't seen the dark matter yet in this picture. Uh, it pre correctly predicted, um, you know, 99.9% .9 of models uh, about TeV scale physics before the LHC have been ruled out by the LHC. But this has not yet been ruled out <laughs> and actually made a mild correct prediction of the Higgs mass between 120 and 135 GeV. Very, very mild, but it could have been wrong. Um, it's conceivable that the gluino might still be in the reach of the LHC. Um, it's hard to know where the, where the gluino is. It depends a lot on um, what exactly the dark matter is. But if the bottom of the spectrum is the one to three TeV, then if the gluino is, is at you know, uh, two and a half or three TeV, it might barely be, be produced at the LHC. If it's heavier than that, it won't be in reach of the LHC. So, and that's something again that we've said already back from the sort of day one in these models. In a big chunk of parameter space, you could imagine seeing the electroweakinos and the gluinos at the LHC and a big chunk, uh, you don't. It's 50-50 proposition. Um, but both the electroequinos and the gluinos would be uh, copiously produced at 100 TeV collider. And this is not something where you could sort of make an excuse and, and keep pushing it a factor of 10 higher. Uh, uh, it really has to be seen at a 100 TeV collider if the basic premises of this uh, framework are correct. And something uh, I think which is very exciting is uh, experimentally the searches for electric dipole moments are just getting better and better. The uh, collaboration of uh, uh, Dave DeMille, John Doyle, and uh, um, Jerry Gabriel uh, already pushed the EDM a factor of 100 beneath, uh, uh, beneath the sort of previous bounds down to around 10 to the minus 29 e centimeters. They tell me that on the time scale of five, six, seven years, they'll get to 10 to the minus 31, 10 to the minus 32 centimeters. And there is an electric dipole moment in many split Susie coming from uh, two loops of, um, at two loop level from uh, loops of the, of the uh, Higginos uh, and uh, electric, the electroequinos and the Higgs, that is in the neighborhood between 10 to the minus 28 and 10 to the minus 31 uh, e centimeters if all the CP violating phases are big. So that's, I think, something I'm very excited about. Uh, uh, um, uh, and, and any signal that they might see, if they see an EDM, then, it's, uh, then they're probing indirectly sort of two loop uh, 50 TeV scale physics. It's quite uh, uh, remarkable. All right, so that's what I think is going on. That's what I still think, you know, at zeroth order is going on. As I said, if you put a gun to my head in the middle of the night, that's what I think is going on. But um, I do think that it's worth uh, rethinking everything given the situation that we're in. And so um, that's what I want to talk about uh, today is, uh, is different ideas. Um, and I understand that Hyungdo Kim has already given some, uh, has already given a, 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 a talk, I think, uh, at the KIS about the second topic here. So I will talk about it. Um, uh, but maybe a little more quickly, given that it's been talked about already. 
um, uh, the, the, this, uh, this paper that uh, came out with Rafael Daniolo and Hyungdo of the idea of the weak scale as a trigger is a sort of very concrete model. Um, uh, uh, the first part of the talk that I'll spend a little bit longer um, uh, discussing are, uh, as I said, somewhat more speculative ideas, um, uh, but more structural uh, ideas about uh, the UVIR connection, possible hidden symmetries, and this notion of tuning and transcendentality. And some of these things are uh, based on some uh, uh, long ongoing discussions with uh, uh, Yuval Grossman. Okay, so let's uh, uh, let's just to, to, to set things in a little bit of context again. Why, um, what the drama is around the uh, hierarchy problem? I think uh, we can really summarize that uh, three centuries of progress in fundamental physics from the 17th to the 20th centuries is the march of reductionism and the march of symmetries, um, and uh, uh, that highlights the, 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 the drama of the questions that we have to deal with in the 21st century. Um, we expect that the notion of space-time, because of quantum mechanics and gravity, the space-time is an approximate notion and has to be uh, replaced with more primitive building blocks. Um, uh, that's associated with the end of the notion of reductionism and the fundamental falsehood, as I will talk about in a second, of the entire Wilsonian paradigm at a, at a deep level. Um, uh, and we also don't uh, know, perhaps relatedly, the answer to the question, why do we have a macroscopic universe? Why is the universe big uh, with large things in it? Uh, those are related to the, to the uh, fine tuning problems, the cosmological constant and hierarchy problems. And so I think it's clear that really new, uh, these, these two questions might be related to each other. Uh, it's clear that really new ideas are needed beyond the paradigm of space time and internal symmetries that have guided us so well for, for so long. So for instance, What's the issue with the, uh, the hierarchy problem? Uh, we normally phrase it as the, why is the, 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 the Higgs so much lighter than some fundamental ultraviolet scale in the problem? Why don't we have a similar issue with the photon? Well, it's because uh, the photon has spin and there is a deep difference between massless and massive particles with spin um, that the number of degrees of freedom jumps discontinuously. Again, this is again, because of quantum mechanics and relativity. Um, uh, massless particles have two degrees of freedom. That's the, the, the two helicities. That's the Wigner little group. It have two degrees of freedom, but massive particles have three. And therefore any interactions uh, the photon can have with all the virtual particles in the vacuum cannot discontinuously change two to three. And that's why it's, uh, it's possible for the photon to be massless. And this is the reason why gauge fields and chiral fermions can be easily engineered in condensed matter systems. Um, uh, and why they're robust. All you have to do is somehow manage to make up a setup where you get two gapless degrees of freedom, and then it's going to be insensitive to small perturbations because you can't uh, discontinuously change two into three. And that's the difficulty with the Higgs. Uh, this highlights um, that uh, what's special about the Higgs, it has spin zero. Uh, and so there is no difference in the number of degrees of freedom between a massless and massive spin zero particle. Uh, and so when we talk about the interaction of the Higgs with the virtual particles in the vacuum, like the loop of the top quark, um, uh, we don't understand uh, uh, we don't understand why its masslessness is robust to these uh, uh, perturbations. Okay, um, so this this highlight of the Higgs is really special. Um, while things like uh, uh, gauge fields and chiral fermions can be easily engineered in condensed matter systems, no one has easily engineered a Higgs in a condensed matter system. In fact, the fact that we don't see uh, uh, non goldstone scalars in, in typical condensed matter systems is a perfect validation of the naturalness Wilsonian paradigm in condensed matter physics. The only situations people have managed to get something like an, uh, an elementary scalar is definitely with fine tuning of the parameters of the model in order to bring the scalar down exactly as you would expect. And without that, in a state of nature, you don't, you don't just see uh, uh, effective spin zero degrees of freedom that are interacting at long distances. Okay, so the Higgs is special, and yet we see it in our world. So somehow our world does not look like a garden variety condensed matter system. Uh, and uh, there's essentially exactly the same issue, uh, basically conceptually, with the cosmological constant. Again, we can, uh, so I'd say the, both the cosmological constant and the Higgs mass are an indication that we need to go beyond symmetries. The difficulty with the Higgs mass, the hierarchy problem, is that we have one degree of freedom.
Hello. Oh, are we not hearing Emma? Yeah, I, I cannot hear. Okay, me neither. So I, I guess he will re reconnect. I okay. hope. Yes. Okay. Could you, so Jaehyun, could you send an email to him that the, his connection is lost? Oh, okay, I will. Hi guys, sorry about that. As I warned you, um, I was gonna drop out that, that I've been having terrible internet connectivity problems. And so uh, I just uh, dropped out there, unfortunately. Uh, can, can you hear me now okay? Yes, yes. we can. Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Let me just go back. Uh, I think I know where, all right. Okay, so, all right, so, okay. So just the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the summary here was that we have the same issue with the, both the Higgs mass and the cosmological constant. There's no difference in the number of degrees of freedom. There's no difference in the amount of symmetry as the relevant parameter crosses from being zero to positive or negative. And so whatever our thinking is about these problems have to go beyond, uh, uh, beyond the usual picture of uh, uh, space time symmetries that has served us so well before. So, um, so for both of these sort of big questions of uh, uh, why there's a macroscopic universe, which is the question of why the cosmological constant is small, uh, and uh, and why the uh, the uh, Higgs mass is 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 small. Uh, the the uh, the larger theoretical question of uh, emergent space time. These things make it obvious that we're missing something huge about the quantum mechanics of our relativistic vacuum. Um, and I want to stress for uh, particle physicists that the Higgs discovery is really crucial here. Um, because it makes it clear that uh, some of these issues about the emergence of space time and the UVIR connection that I'm going to review uh, in a moment seem to be intrinsically gravitational, have to do with M Planck. And so you would think, yeah, maybe there's something exciting and strange going on up there. But in the neighborhood of the weak scale, uh, that's far from there, and everything there should still be normal. Well, the fact that we've seen the Higgs and nothing else, and that the basic sort of naturalist paradigm has not worked out the way people uh, expected is an indication that our relativistic vacuum is qualitatively different than anything we've seen anywhere else in physics. Certainly nothing like it has been engineered in condensed matter systems, not just at the Planck scale, but already at the TV scale. So for me, this is extremely uh, uh, important that, that it at least makes it conceivable that, that some of the drama that we associate with these uh, larger questions uh, is actually going to be relevant already at the uh, TV scale. All right. So, let me talk about, as I said again, the more sort of uh, uh, the more speculative ideas. Um, first, I'll spend a little longer uh, on these, and um, uh, uh, but they, they they have to do with the UVIR connection, the possibility of hidden symmetries, and and what I'm calling, for reasons that, that will become obvious later, uh, transcendental tuning. Okay, so. All right, so what is the UVIR connection? Again, the sort of uh, the biggest deal about the Wilsonian picture of the world is the perfect decoupling between ultra short distances and uh, ultra long distances. The slogan is that you need a microscope to see short distances. Okay, that's perfectly fine. But, um, uh, but in the real world, because of gravity, we know that that's ultimately false. And that's because as we use higher and higher energies to probe shorter and shorter distances, at some point, we put so much energy into such a small region of space that we collapse the region that we're looking at into a black hole. Uh, that happens at around the Planck scale. And then if we use even higher energies, we make an even larger black hole. And so higher energies stop, turn, stop going to shorter and shorter distances, and they actually come back around to probing longer and longer distances again. So this is, this is very well appreciated for decades, hugely important. 
And uh, one of its consequences of the notion of space-time is approximate because there's no experiment we can do that actually uh, probes um, uh, space-time separations uh, at the Planck scale. Any experiment which does so produces a black hole instead that makes it impossible to see what we're, uh, what we're trying to look at. Um, an equally important aspect of this is that reductionism and the Wilsonian effective field theory paradigm is just false. Um, and, uh, and the fundamental laws of nature are nothing like that of condensed matter physics, which is where the Wilsonian picture of the world was born. They're likely far deeper and more radical. But this has been appreciated for decades, but, but people have also thought that, if the, that, that this is probably true, but the, the distinction is only relevant near the uh, Planck scale. Now, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about some, uh, I'm going to talk about ways in which the UVIR connection might actually show up and might be relevant for, uh, for, uh, uh, for the physics of the Higgs. Um, but before telling you about, uh, before telling you about um, uh, the, the sort of uh, the, the specific ideas, I want to make a general point. Um, and, and this is a general point about uh, 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 a set of uh, uh, observables associated with the Higgs that are really crucial to look at experimentally, which, uh, which, uh, which I think we could be doing a lot more to put under a microscope. So the point is that uh, it's crucial to probe both the on-shell properties of the Higgs, that's clear, but that's also the sort of Lorentzian physics of producing the Higgs and having the Higgs decay, as well as the off-shell couplings of the Higgs. Uh, that's because in the conventional you know, local field theory picture, the off-shell um, uh, uh, couplings of the Higgs has to do with Euclidean momentum transfers, okay, or Euclidean um, uh, momenta in loops. Um, and this is important because the Wilsonian paradigm is fundamentally Euclidean. Uh, even the entire picture that, that, uh, that there's a distinction between short distances and long distances only really makes sense in Euclidean space. After all, in Minkowski space, you can have two points uh, whose space-time separation is very small, so x minus y squared is close to zero, but they could literally be light years apart from each other if they're close to the light cone. Okay? So this sort of decoupling between short and long distances is not so obvious in Minkowski space. You really need Wilsonian, uh, you really need Euclidean space for that decoupling to be perfect. And in fact, the standard picture of local quantum field theory is really Euclidean, and we get to the physical stuff in Minkowski space by analytic con continuation. Again, when we have local quantum field theory, this is perfectly allowed. But the entire picture of, uh, of the, this UVIR connection, which as, as I, I just told you is sort of forced on us by gravity, uh, this UVIR connection can actually radically change this. It can radically change the expectations from, uh, from what you see in Euclidean space to an analytic continuation to uh, Minkowski space. Um, in a way, that's not small. Okay, so that's that's really what I'm what I'm getting at. You might think that the UVIR business is all at the Planck scale and is irrelevant, but now I want to give you some examples uh, where something like this UVIR uh, connection can can change what naively looks like a reliable effective field theory calculation. I'm going to give you toy examples of effective field theory calculations where this sort of UVIR um, uh, connection is going to change the answer by order 100%. Okay, so it's going to make a very big difference, and uh, and where it violates the usual rule is exactly in this, uh, in this uh, connection between uh, Euclidean and Lorentzian um, uh, physics. Okay, so, so that's why it's really important to sort of probe these things uh, experimentally. And I'll, I'll, I'll come in a second to what, what kind of, uh, what rough kind of um, uh, uh, observables we'll be talking about. But I want to just give you an example. Uh, so so um, I'm just going to give a, uh, 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 a, a very simple example that, that shows um, how this uh, can work. So suppose you're an experimentalist and you've measured some quantity with units of time, T, and you've measured it experimentally when T is bigger than some short distance scale T U V. Okay, so, uh, so, here's, uh, so here's my scale uh, T U V. You've measured it for T much bigger than T U V and you find that it's one over two to very good precision. Now you're a real experimentalist, so you've measured it on the real time axis for positive time. That's where you've measured it. But 
all the way out here on the positive uh, t-axis, it looks like one over t. So you announce this to your theorist friends, and they say, aha, good. So I know what this function is. It's one over t. OK? Uh, and one over t has a beautiful analytic continuation uh, everywhere for all values of t. So here I've plotted it in the sort of complex t plane. OK? And now, because, you're, uh, because your theorist friend is so, so clever, they say, look, um, even though you haven't measured what your function is for a very small t, I'm going to make a prediction that there's some kind of singularity at the origin um, in, the, uh, in the t plane. And how do I know? It's because if I look at this big contour integral, you see, I'm going to do a, con I'm going to do a contour integral at large t, um, 1 over 2 pi i, the integral dt f of t. And because out here it looks like 1 over t, um, I, I can reliably do that integral. I'm avoiding what's going on near t equals 0. I'm very far away. So this is my toy example of a quote unquote effective field theory calculation. I'm very far away, uh, but I can reliably do that integral and it's one, all right? All right, now your experimental friend might complain, oh, but you know, you're continuing out here. I don't know, I don't engage in the measurement here. Why are you doing this? You say, oh, don't bother me. Uh, this, is just, this is just clear. I can always analytically continue the answer. You got one over t, one over t is analytic. I'm gonna continue it everywhere. And so everything is fine. All right, because you're a smart theorist, you say that, you say I have a very reliable, effective, quote unquote, effective field theory calculation. By quote unquote, effective field theory, I just mean a calculation that does not seem to rely on what's going on in very short times. It's something that I can do out here. And when I, but of course, it's crucial that I do this analytic uh, continuation into the complex T plane that seems completely legal. Okay, so you say that's my reliable calculation, and the answer is equal to one. OK, but that could be completely wrong. And now let me give you a simple example. The actual function f of t could look like this, what I've drawn here. OK, it could look like 1 minus 10 to the minus 120 t over t u v. OK, so when t is bigger than t u v is positive, this correction is exponentially tiny. So no wonder your experimentalist friend didn't notice it. It's an exponentially tiny correction. However, if you look at this exact function, you see that near t equals zero, it has no singularities at all. When I expand this guy out, uh, it goes like t at small t. It has no singularities whatsoever near t equals zero. It's a completely smooth function. And therefore, the exact answer uh, uh, for this apparently reliable calculation will give you, instead of one, it will give you zero. OK? So, that's kind of a little bit striking because you thought that you could do this reliable calculation totally uninfected by high energy physics, short time physics in this case. Um, it involves a continuation to complex T away from where you've measured it for real uh, time. You continue to complex time, which means you continue to Euclidean space. And when you do that Euclidean calculation, you seem to get this reliable answer, which is one, but the exact answer is actually zero. And the difference between, uh, and this is uh, from an effect which is exponentially tiny where you've measured it. Of course, this function differs from one over t by an exponentially large amount out here. Okay? Out here, it differs by an exponentially large amount. Um, but where you've measured it uh, for, real, uh, for real positive times, uh, the difference is exponentially tiny. Okay, uh, this might look like a like a uh, like an abstruse sort of random example. In fact, the, the mechanism is not abstruse, uh, abstruse and random. I'm going to show you uh, uh, a little bit more mechanically how it works. But exactly this mechanism uh, has been seen in other contexts. For example, in the ADS-CFT correspondence, um, when you look at uh, correlation functions of, uh, of of four operators on the boundary, if you imagine that you have uh, uh, if you do the calculation using Feynman diagrams or Witten diagrams in anti de space, then uh, they can have a singularity. They can have a singularity when the sort of beams coming out of the four points can meet at a point in the bulk. And in fact, the presence of that singularity in the correlation function is how you can sort of look for a point in the bulk. But we expect that in a gravitational theory, it's not local. It's not exactly local. As we said, we shouldn't be able to see bulk points. And so that singularity should somehow be removed. And in fact, it's true that, uh, that, uh, that the 
the ex an exact conformal field theory actually does not have that singularity at all, even though it's there to all orders in the uh, in the uh, in the expansion and powers of G Newton. Okay, but a non-perturbative gravitational effect just removes it. Okay. All right. So um, now let me let me explain uh, let me explain how this works in a little bit more detail. Can you guys see my screen? All right, so, um, so here's how it works in, in, in more detail. Um, uh, I want to, 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 to show you uh, how this, uh, uh, how this uh, uh, singularity can, can, can be removed. To begin with, let me imagine that I got this one over T uh, is coming from some kind of integral over energy. So one over T is like uh, integral DE, E to the I, E T. Okay, and so if we have that, the fact that there's a pole here at T equals zero, is due to this exponential here, this e to the i energy t. And why is there a pole at t equals zero? Because uh, if I change t so that t has a negative imaginary part, this oscillating phase will now grow exponentially. Okay? So as I move t in the complex t plane, uh, when t acquires a negative imaginary part, this integral is divergent. And that's why there has to be some kind of singularity at t equals zero. Now. Uh, let's say that we make a guess uh, that what's going on at uh, at high energies is um, uh, uh, is not is is modified. So that means this integrand is modified. So instead of just d over e, it's modulated by some power of e over some cutoff. Okay, that's what we'd expect in a field theory: is that high energy behavior of all quantities dies off as a power, and even if there's a power law here it will change the precise nature of the singularity at t equals zero, but there'll always be a singularity there. For example, it'll be a branch cut in, in general here, but there still has to be a singularity at t equals zero because of the same argument. If I give t, uh, make it negative imaginary, the exponential blows up and therefore the integral blows up. And so the answer uh, has to have, um, uh, the answer has to have a singularity at t equals zero. So if I have this kind of behavior that just falls off as a power law, then uh, this integral, uh, the, the contour integral that we talked about, uh, very far away, away from t equals zero, will always equal one. And it'll still always equal one here, okay? Um, but let's say that this high energy behavior actually doesn't just fall off like a power, but falls off exponentially. And in fact, falls off faster than uh, uh, e to the minus energy. So I've given an example here, it falls off like e to the minus energy squared. Now, that's the kind of uh, fall off that we expect in gravitational theories. So uh, for all kinds of correlation functions, but just to give you an example, if you talk about a two to two scattering amplitude in gravity at energy is way above the Planck scale, what happens when you collide two particles and you make a black hole. Um, and so the probability of that black hole coming back out in two particles is exponentially small, either the negative, the entropy of the black hole. So the two to two amplitudes and all kinds of fixed point correlation functions actually die exponentially faster than, uh, uh, in fact, like even the minus energy squared, okay? Uh, so this is a kind of a typical gravitational behavior for high energy uh, uh, correlation functions. And notice that if we had this at high energies instead, then all of a sudden there's no singularity at t equals zero at all, because no matter what's going on with t, even if I make t negative imaginary, this exponential is, uh, is making everything well-defined at large energy. Um, and so there's no singularity at all at t equals zero. This is an entire function of t, and therefore when I do this contour integral around t, I get zero instead of one. So this is our sort of first example of where modifying the quote-unquote physics at arbitrarily high energy. So the scale lambda could be arbitrarily far away. Um, we, uh, can change the answer for a seemingly reliable effective field theory calculation, um, by which I mean a calculation that's staying far away from t equals zero. But uh, some modification that I do super far away can, can change the answer by 100%. It changed the answer from one to zero. Okay. And, and, uh, and as I said, this is not just some sort of random academic example. This is exactly the phenomenon for removing the so-called bulk point singularity in uh, uh, ADS so CFT. So maybe something like this is going on. Okay, so again, this is a, this is a speculation, but maybe something like this is going on um, that, uh, that changes the sort of calculus of the discussion 
of the uh, of the of, of the loop corrections uh, to the Higgs map. And I want to remind you that our very first step in doing all these loop computations and corrections to the Higgs or anything else is to rotate the Euclidean space. Okay, we rotate to a, a, a Euclidean space and then we do the computation there. So it's really crucial. Uh, just uh, it's really crucial to probe experimentally, even if we don't have a very concrete theoretical idea for what, what might be going on there. The very fact that we've seen an example where we can modify things in Euclidean space um, and change the answer by order 100%, um, even though uh, we, in the, the, the observable on shell things in Minkowski space are unaffected, um, it's clearly crucial to probe the uh, Euclidean off shell properties of the Higgs. And so, uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that um, we, we need to somehow probe, for example, the Higgs TT bar coupling uh, when the TT bar are off shell by more than, let's say, a few hundred GeV. I want to stress this is not standard compositeness. I'm not talking about top partners or composite Higgs or composite tops. This is something weirder. This is some sort of mutual non locality between the Higgs and TT bar. So I don't have a concrete model for it yet, but. Uh, uh, but, uh, but that's the sort of rough idea is that if that vertex shuts off when the top quarks get off shell by more than a few hundred GeV, then, uh, then that of course changes the whole discussion about the, uh, about the uh, hierarchy problem. Um, and uh, and oh, it has to shut off by uh, let's say around 500 GeV or so, so that uh, uh, three lambda top squared over eight pi squared times this scale squared gives us roughly the mass of the Higgs. So now there are some sort of qualitative uh, uh, things associated with this picture. First, uh, of course, there are processes like Higgs to blue blue and Higgs to gamma gamma, um, which are mediated by virtual, uh, virtual particles, tops and Ws in the loop. But we know that they're also dominated by where those particles are actually on shell. So the, the, the contribution, the size of the contribution the Higgs to glue glue and Higgs to gamma gamma that's coming from the region of momenta where the tops are, let's say, off shell by more than 500 GeV would modify Higgs to gamma gamma by about 3% and Higgs to glue glue by about 10%. Um, so uh, the 3% the here is because just the top quarks already make about a one third contribution to Higgs to gamma gamma relative to the W loop. Okay, so it's a sort of 10% 10% uh, uh, of the virtual correction from the tops we're saying is modified. And so you respect a 3% modification, about 3% modification to Higgs to gamma gamma and 10% to Higgs to glue glue. These are things that are sort of on the margins of what we'll see from the LHC, but they're massive signals at a Higgs factor. Okay? So, and there's also um, another more direct signal, which is that if we're shutting off the, the Higgs TT bar vertex, when the tops get off shell by more than a, a few hundred GeV, then this process, TT bar Higgs, should shut off when the PT of the Higgses get bigger than a few hundred GeV. Okay, now, so that's really the sort of smoking gun of this, uh, of this whole idea, is that TT bar Higgs cross-section, of course, is already small, but as a function of the PT of the Higgses, it should just, it should just shut off when the PT gets bigger than, uh, let's say, 500 GeV. Uh, PT bar Higgs is something that we're barely seeing at the uh, LHC. Um, and uh, I think uh, it would be really good if there was some sort of, uh, uh, I, I would like to do it at some point myself, but some sort of dedicated studies on what's uh, really possible. Um, if we really see enough of this, if we have enough rate for this, even at 100 TV collider to be able to see if it's shutting off for a big enough PT. So my guess is that the, the rate is high enough at 100 TV collider that we'll be able to uh, see that. Okay, so. All right, so this is just a, a, a so again, just the, 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 the summary is, is the qualitative point is that we have to, uh, is, is that a, a big part of the assumption that brings us into the usual Wilsonian picture, et cetera, is uh, the, the, the blithe continuation between, uh, uh, between uh, Euclidean space and Minkowski space. But when we have UVIR uh, connections, um, that can be, that, there are examples where that can be changed by 100%. Um, in other words, even though the, the physics is uh, at the Planck scale, it can change certain quantities that we thought were reliable calculations, but which involved continuation to Euclidean space, we could change them by order uh, by, by, by 100%. And since that's even roughly possible, it's really important to, to probe uh, not just the on-shell properties of the Higgs, but the off-shell properties, which means, that, uh, which means these kind of level of precision 
uh, in, uh, in, in, in Higgs couplings and uh, most directly uh, any process that involves a probe of the Higgs TT bar vertex uh, uh, where, the, where the tops are offshell by more than a few hundred feet. All right, uh, maybe I'll, I'll stop there to see, are there any, any questions about that? So that, that was just, uh, that's just uh, a motivational thing. And now I'll go into uh, uh, some more, uh, 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 yet another idea and, uh, uh, and uh, some more concrete examples. Uh, any questions? Okay, all right. Um. Yes. One question. Could you realize this in a field theory setup, like, for example, putting additional particles uh, at a high mass, which is modifying the Higgs to TT bar vertex uh, above such an energy scale? Uh, well, no, sure. I mean, uh, uh, if you're uh, uh, what 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 we've seen, you know, zillions of examples of are some version of compositeness, be it top compositeness or Higgs compositeness where we do do something to this vertex, but uh, it's associated with new resonances and so on, right? So really the whole idea here is that you don't see any differences in the Lorentzian regime. So you would not see new particles. You would not see, uh, you would not see anything, any on-shell things would not be changed. You're only affecting things in the Euclidean region. Um, I'm gonna give you a more concrete sort of idea behind this uh, in, in uh, in a second, um, but that's really the sort of main main difference. Uh, normally, and just 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 to say something, uh, just to say something now. There's been papers for decades where people do really sort of idiotic things, like you put a big form factor in Euclidean space. You say, ah, I'm going to solve the hierarchy problem by by putting this vertex of form factor e to the minus momentum squared, and in order for that to make sense, that e to the minus momentum squared, in order for that to be a damping. You have to put that in Euclidean space. Okay, now, why is that such a dumb thing? It's because when you smear things out in Euclidean space, when you, uh, when, uh, when you go back to Minkowski space, it is not at all obvious that you smear them out only backward in time. In fact, if you smear things out in Euclidean space, you'd expect that you smear them out in, in, uh, in Minkowski space, and that violates causality. And that's, uh, so, so almost every uh, sort of, uh, every obvious exponentially soft form factor you'd write down in Euclidean space would give you things that badly violate causality back in Minkowski space. The sort of trick here has to be some modification of things in Euclidean space, which does not look so brutal as being exponentially soft everywhere uh, uh, at large momenta. It somehow only affects things in the Euclidean uh, domain while not changing any of the sort of on-shell poles, cups, and so on that we normally associate with uh, field theory. Okay, so that's, uh, um, and, uh, and almost all models that we know and love actually modify that. And that's, that, that's what we actually go and look for. We look for new particle states, we look for, uh, and, 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 and so on. Okay, so, so this, is a, this is a somewhat different idea. Um, and, uh, uh, but I don't have a, so, so if you're asking for a specific field theory model, I don't have a specific field theory model for it yet. Um, but just uh, uh, hold your horses because we're going to combine it with sort of one other rough idea and you'll at least see a, a toy model for what such a model might look like in a moment. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? So I have a question. So, uh, uh, so do you uh, mean that the, uh, at, at, at the uh, uh, high energy, uh, higher than 500 GeV, uh, effectively in Higgs sector, you have uh, uh, emergent scale symmetry? Well, uh, 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 yeah, if that, I think if the, if all the couplings of the Higgs to everyone else sort of shuts off uh, at that scale, yeah, that, that, that uh, uh, but again, it can't be, it can't be a blanket thing, but in the Euclidean domain, you would have to have something that looks like an effective uh, emergent scale, scale, scale symmetry. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, so what, what I really wanted you to take from those examples is just, uh, 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 and, I, and you know, I have like five or six examples of this rough sort. I was giving you one of the, 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 the example I, I, I gave you has the advantage that we've actually seen literally that phenomenon elsewhere, uh, this block point singularity business. But there's a number of toy examples like this, just so you see that the words that we often say, um, uh, let me just back up for a sec. People have said for years, 
oh, there's UVIR, maybe that'll affect uh, the Higgs or the cosmological constant. And the counter to that is, come on, give me a break. Um, we have an integral, integral like uh, d p squared. Um, that's the integral for the for the Higgs mass squared. Um, so what? You're doing something funny far away. How's that going to change the usual logic of the discussion that from the regime where we can sort of calculate and, and reliably see there's a huge contribution? What kind of crazy conspiracy would you have very far away that's going to cancel it and so on? Okay. Um, this is just an example of precisely that, that, precisely something that would look to you like a crazy conspiracy, that some, uh, the, some modification arbitrarily far away totally changes what seems like a reliable calculation. Okay, so, um, so it has not turned into a, a, a real theory, but it's just giving you examples that that phenomenon is possible. Okay? That, 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 that phenomenon is possible, and we've actually seen it, uh, uh, we've seen it uh, elsewhere. Okay, so now um, let me uh, move on to add another uh, ingredient. So here's an, another fantasy, is that maybe there's some hidden symmetry that we don't know about. Um, and uh, uh, maybe there's some hidden symmetries associated with the standard model that we don't know about. And maybe these hidden symmetries um, uh, have something to do with, uh, are, are of some relevance for this uh, problem. Um, and uh, that might sound crazy at first. What kind of hidden symmetries could we possibly be, be uh, talking about? Don't we know all the symmetries yet? Um, well, first of all, uh, you know, uh, if, if the year was 1969, uh, we didn't know about supersymmetry yet. So at any given moment in time, our, our knowledge of the symmetries is not necessarily uh, complete. They're the ones that we know about. And by definition, the, the ones that we don't know about, we don't know about yet. Um, so it's not inconceivable that there's some hidden symmetries that we haven't uh, uh, thought of yet, but it's actually more than that. Um, and here, I just want to spend uh, you know, five minutes telling you about um, uh, the, the, the real thrust of my own research program in the last uh, 10 years or so that has nothing to do with the questions of this talk on the surface, but a motivation behind my going down this line was uh, in the back of my mind exactly the issues having to do with the possible new approach to, to the hierarchy and uh, cosmological constant problem. Um, so let me just take five minutes to, uh, to, 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 to tell you what, what I've been up to for the past uh, 10, 10, 10 years or so. So many of my friends and I, for the past 10 years, have been thinking about very basic facts about quantum field theory. Again, it's really motivated from the fact that the, the deep questions about uh, uh, both emergent space-time as well as the hierarchy and the cosmological constant problems really go to the, to the, to the basic essentials of uh, what we understand of locality, uh, 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 unitarity, and, uh, and, uh, and field theory. Um, so, uh, so we've been thinking about uh, the physics of scattering amplitudes, and uh, we've been thinking about um, this as an arena to kind of uh, think about the emergence of uh, space-time and quantum mechanics from more primitive, um, uh, from more primitive starting points. Because after all, when we collide particles, um, uh, for the experimentalists at infinity colliding particles, we don't know um, uh, that there is a, a space time on the inside that the particles are propagating in. We don't know there's a Hilbert space that a wave function is evolving in. We throw particles in, we close our eyes, the particles come out. And in uh, the pattern of the cross sections that we measure, um, there's some fingerprint to the fact that we can interpret uh, these amplitudes uh, as arising from local unitary evolution in space time. So there's a sort of a question mark, what, what's giving rise to this, whatever this, this is that my experimental set infinity is measuring. And the usual answer is that we fill in the inside of this, uh, of this question mark with space time and quantum mechanics. So local evolution in space time, unitary evolution in Hilbert space. And, but the actual question doesn't live in the interior of space time, doesn't make reference to it to a Hilbert space. Um, and so uh, we've been asking the question, could, uh, could the amplitudes be the answer to a very different kind of question? And that's what we've been looking for in many examples um, is a, some different structure and involves a, and what we're seeing involves some new interesting uh, uh, structures in mathematics in combinatorics, geometry, number theory, fascinating parts of mathematics that have never before uh, uh, actively interacted with you know basic physics. This is bread and butter of basic physics. Um, but anyway, there are, some, there are some very interesting mathematical structures that sort of live in the kinematical space at infinity, the uh, kinematical space that specifies the uh, scattering process. And, uh, and so we're discovering natural questions in that space 
whose answer are the amplitudes. And then we can begin to read out from that structure why that answer has the properties that we normally ascribe to uh, the presence of space-time and quantum mechanics. So what we've been doing is then the, it's really a new strategy to look for some new principles, new laws from which causal and unitary evolution or the rules of local space-time physics and quantum mechanics emerge. And actually they emerge together. In the examples that we've seen, you can't separate space-time and quantum mechanics. They sort of come together uh, out, of these new, uh, out of these new structures. So, uh, so the, the, the words associated with, uh, with these structures in kinematic space are, are, are positive, are quote unquote positive geometries. And this is not going to be a talk about that subject at all, but, I, but, I'm, uh, but it's a motivation for what you're going to see next. Okay, is that, so, so, so far we understand it in a number of settings. It began in yang mills theory uh, and the maximally supersymmetric cousin of uh, yang mills theory, where this geometry um, uh, was known as the amphitohedron. Uh, in the last three years or so, we've been seeing it in totally non-supersymmetric theories like phi cube theory. And here there's another set of geometries uh, that are known uh, as associahedra. And uh, actually over the course of the pandemic over the past year, um, uh, back, back in 2017, uh, we understood how this works at tree level. In 2019, we understood uh, how it works through to one loop. And what we've been doing now is uh, it, it, a few generalizations were needed to understand this to all loop order and beyond the planar limit. Um, so that's uh, what we've been working on over the past year. So the, the, the sort of the, the buzzword here is uh, uh, what we're calling surface hedra. There are some geometries associated with Riemann surfaces. Um, uh, but uh, so, uh, so the story does not rely on supersymmetry, uh, that there's a supersymmetric uh, version of these ideas. There's a totally non-supersymmetric version of these ideas. But what's relevant for what I want to tell you next is that these geometries actually manifest certain hidden symmetries of, uh, of the amplitudes in these theories. Okay, so uh, I started off by saying, could there be hidden symmetries? Come on, nowhere there are hidden symmetries and so on. But in fact, there are. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, by now 15 years ago, people discovered a new hidden symmetry of this gluon amplitudes. There, it's a new hidden symmetry at tree level uh, that could have been discovered by Yang and Mills in 1954. It wasn't discovered until 2006, okay? Um, and uh, uh, that's known as dual conformal invariance. Um, it's, a, it's a hidden symmetry. And also even for this phi cube theory, even that really certainly surprised me. I didn't think there was anything fascinating going on with phi cube theory, but even phi cube theory, stupid old phi cube theory has certain hidden symmetries. Uh, what we call projective invariance. I don't have time to explain what these things are, but what is uh, germane is that these are uh, these are hidden symmetries and they have consequences. And one of the consequences is that if you take the amplitudes and you go off to infinite momentum in a special way, not in a totally generic way, but if you go off to infinite momentum in a special way, there are huge cancellations between the diagrams. And instead of the amplitudes growing or of just having a certain behavior as you go off to infinity, they are much softer than you would naively expect. Okay, so so uh, so I start off saying, could there be some hidden symmetries? Uh, unlikely, maybe you should think and look. In fact, there are. There are these hidden symmetries, not for random fancy theories, but just for gluons and for phi cube theory. They're hidden. We don't see them in Feynman diagrams individually. Individual Feynman diagrams break them. We only see them in the sum of all the diagrams together. And, uh, and even more tantalizingly, where the symmetries have teeth is in softening certain behavior of amplitudes at infinite momentum. All right. So, okay. So that, that, that's that's just a fact. Now, one of the one of the fascinating things about this connection between uh, amplitudes and geometry is that these hidden symmetries are made completely obvious by these by these uh, geometric structures. Okay. So so the idea is roughly that you give me the momenta of the particles or the gluons or of the scalars of the phi cube theory. And out of that data, I build a certain geometric shape and the volume of that shape calculates the amplitude. That's a very rough uh, picture for what this subject is about. And the very fact that you can interpret the amplitude as a volume uh, makes these symmetries completely obvious. So, um, so term by term, the Feynman diagrams make them invisible, but the geometric structure makes those uh, symmetries obvious. Okay, so all right, so so we've seen that, uh, and that and that that's uh, 
uh, that's continuing. We're, we're learning more and more about it. Um, but uh, having seen that, um, we're going to take that as uh, inspiration for the following speculation. Uh, uh, and the speculation is that there is some kind of dual form. So you can think of these uh, formulations as, as dual formulations of field theory. There are formulations that don't look like field theory at all. Okay, so you take you give me the, the momentum of the particles, I build some geometric shape and I calculate its volume. So it does not remotely look like local quantum field theory. It does not remotely look like the sum of uh, uh, Feynman diagrams, but, um, uh, but there is a, there's a way of presenting it. And technically uh, you're computing the volume of this object. So uh, to compute the volume, it's often useful to triangulate into pieces and particular ways of doing the triangulation match what we see from a Feynman diagram. But there are other ways that uh, are, are less, less familiar. And, um, and these particular ways that manifest, uh, that, that relate to Feynman diagrams break these uh, manifest uh, symmetries. So there's something good about them, but there's also something bad about them, okay? So, uh, so we're gonna take as, as all of these developments, just the following uh, inspiration and rough speculation, that there's some dual formulation of physics that represents physical amplitudes or observables like the Higgs mass and the cosmological constant and other things by associating them with these abstract geometries in some way. And uh, then the, the, the fantasy is that in this formulation, the cosmological constant and the Higgs mass parameters will be obviously exponentially small. In other words, uh, there'll be some formula in this new way of doing things, uh, m Higgs squared equals formula. And when you stare at it, it's just obvious that it's something exponentially small. Uh, similarly for the cosmological constant. But uh, the catch is in this uh, representation, it is not obvious that it looks like field theory. Okay? It's not obviously local physics. The idea would be that there would be another representation of exactly the same, uh, the exactly the same quantities that will be interpreted like a local physics calculation. So the another presentation will look like tree level plus loop correction and so on. For example, it looks like a coleman weinberg calculation. I'll give you a model of this in a moment. It will look like that. But when you insist on presenting it so that it looks like local quantum field theory, then the answer that you know ahead of time must be exponentially small is actually presented to you necessarily as a sum over big pieces that have huge cancellations. In them. OK? So, that's the idea, that there's sort of two dual presentations. One of them is obviously not tuned, obviously exponentially small, um, but not obviously local physics. Uh, a dual formulation is obviously local physics, but in that formulation, the fact that it's local physics is obvious, but it looks like it has very um, uh, uh, miraculous uh, fine cancellations between different contributions to the same object. Okay? So that's this kind of basic uh, fantasy that we're imagining. The sort of slogan is that the sort of dual formulation of the physics explains why the Higgs mass and the cosmological constant are tiny. Um, but in order to see that it looks like local physics, you'd have to think about it in this other way, but in the other way, it looks like there's a, a big uh, two. All right, so now I'm going to give you uh, a concrete model of uh, how this works. We're really going to come, come back down to earth here. Okay. Um, let's talk now about the uh, UBIR. Uh, tuning and uh, uh, transcendentality. Um, and uh, let me remind you of at least one aspect of the UV sensitivity uh, in the hierarchy problem. Imagine that we, we, we want to see why is the Higgs mass uh, sensitive to UV physics. Imagine that we couple the Higgs to some massive state. Okay, I'm going to couple the Higgs to some uh, new massive state. Um, and so there's going to be a correction to the potential of the Higgs uh, just from Coleman Weinberg. And here it is. Okay, so uh, so here's what we get from the normal top, but then we also get this contribution m to the fourth log m squared coming from these new massive states, and uh, and uh, and when I expand the dependence of this out on the Higgs mass, uh, there it is. Okay, so I get the usual uh, Yukawa squared m squared contribution to the mass squared of the Higgs. And so, what are the words that we say? We say, look, this is totally calculable. Right? That contribution from these massive states is totally calculable. It comes from coleman weinberg It comes out of this piece that has the log in it. That The piece of the log is calculable. This is a totally calculable thing once you add this massive state to the theory. And so here it is. There's, when I expand it out, there's a calculable correction to the mass of the Higgs. 
Meanwhile, what I have at tree level, it doesn't have any logs in it. It's some polynomial in the Higgs. And so the final answer is the sum of something that I get at tree level uh, plus what I get from loops. Um, and, uh, and how can it be that this thing, which is polynomial, and the thing that comes uh, uh, out of the log are going to magically cancel against uh, each other? All right. So that's one way of talking about the, uh, about the uh, um, about the hierarchy of um, is that, or the, or the UV sensitivity aspect anyway, is that uh, we have this sort of polynomial in the Higgs that comes from the true UV, and then we have the dependence on some, on some uh, other massive state, which has a, is, it, it's transcendental. Uh, it, it, it has, uh, it, it comes with a log. Uh, they're totally different. This is, this is a rational, this is polynomial, this is transcendental. And yet when I add them up, uh, um, why are they canceling to a tremendous uh, accuracy? Okay, so now I'm going to show you um, uh, not only how that can happen, but in fact, precisely the fact that we have this decomposition into rational plus transcendental is going to be the sort of origin of, uh, of um, uh, I'm going to explain why exactly when we can have this decomposition into pieces that are sort of number theoretically different, rational and irrational, rational and transcendental, um, why that's a very natural setting in which we should expect to see huge cancellations between different terms. Um, uh, before uh, uh, before uh, getting into that uh, speculation, um, uh, I want to mention that, uh, that things like this have long been noticed uh, to happen in field theory calculations. For example, um, if any of you have ever done the calculation of the lifetime of positronium, you can look it up in Peskin and Schroeder, or you can uh, do it wherever you want. There's all kinds of pieces that you understand very well, the parametric dependence that you understand very well, but there's this funny factor of pi squared minus nine that comes up in the calculation, okay? And that's a funny factor because that's nearly zero, right? Of course, so that's about a, you know, that's about a 10% accident that pi squared minus nine is not exactly zero, but it's pretty close to zero, okay? And I certainly noticed that as a student, and I thought, well, that's just one of those accidents. There's nothing deep about that. Um, this uh, collaboration, uh, this discussion with Yuval Grossman actually started when Yuval told me over dinner once about many more examples of that phenomenon that he'd noticed in B physics and elsewhere of, um, of, uh, of uh, in concrete calculations, these pies and rational things nearly canceling, sometimes to an accuracy of one in a hundred, one time, sometimes even to an accuracy of one in a thousand. Okay, so uh, and so he was just saying, could this have been the hierarchy problem? Blah blah. So uh, so we, we we thought about a little and realized that this is not an accident. These things happen for a good reason, uh, and so I'm going to explain what that reason is uh, uh, now. Okay, so so um, uh, uh, we're going to illustrate everything already with a very simple example. Um, uh, so this this. Uh, th 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 and everything I'm telling you is sort of ancient mathematics. So these things have been understood since the 1800s. I don't know by who exactly, but uh, but but this is all uh, this is all very very standard stuff. Um, uh, and it has to do with the rational approximations to irrational numbers, or even to uh, uh, transcendental numbers. Um, but let me illustrate the ideas already with the simplest example of of log two. Okay, so here's log two, and log two is the integral of zero to one uh, uh, dx over one plus x. Now log two is uh, transcendental, it's irrational, also transcendental. And you can ask, why do I get just a fancy number like log two out of this integral? After all, if it was dx x, I would just get a half. It was dx over one plus x squared, I would also get a rational number. Why is it that uh, when I have dx over one plus x, I get a, a fancy transcendental number? And the reason is that even though I'm doing this integral from zero to one, uh, uh, the integrand has a pole, has a simple pole at x equals minus one. And that means that if I chose a different contour to go between uh, zero and one, I would get an answer that differs by two pi i. So therefore pi is in there, okay? So that this, uh, uh, this integral has enough complexity to generate pi, which is the logarithm of minus one, okay? Uh, I pi is the logarithm of minus one, All right? So that's why we can get a transcendental number out of this is that the integrand has a singularity, has a pole, of course, outside the domain of integration, it has a pole here at, uh, uh, at, at minus one, okay? All right, so 
Uh, that tells us something interesting, that if I consider a modified integral, which is 0 to 1 dx over 1 plus x, um, and I, I multiply it by any polynomial in x, then this tells me something interesting. Uh, whatever the residue is here at, at x equals minus 1, so p at minus 1, I'm going to get p at minus 1 times log 2. And then if there was no residue at x equals minus 1, I'd get a rational number. So therefore, ahead of time, I know this integral has to be p of minus 1 log 2 plus something rational. Okay. So that's kind of interesting. This integral is whatever it is numerically, just some number. But it isn't just numerically a number. It's made out of two different parts. One part that's as a log, one part that's transcendental, and the other part that's uh, rational. So now I'm going to choose a particular example for this p of x. Okay, so here's my example. Uh, my p of x is going to be x times 1 minus x over 2. You'll notice that x uh, to a power n. You'll notice that x1 minus x over 2 when x equals minus 1 is, uh, is minus 1. So p of minus 1 is going to be plus or minus 1. Okay. And so if I look at this uh, integral ahead of time, I know that this is plus or minus log 2 plus something rational. All right. But on the other hand, notice that between 0 and 1, x times 1 minus x over 2 is small, right? x times 1 minus x over 2 looks like that. Uh, the biggest it gets is 1 8 between 0 and 1. And therefore, this is smaller than 1 over 8 to the n. And so the whole integral is a minuscule number at large n of order 1 over 8 to the n. So what that means is that out of this integral, I'm getting an insanely good rational approximation to log 2. So for instance, if I, out of this integral, see there are no big or small numbers in this integral, I'm just going to put n equals 5, let's say. But if I shove this in, then, uh, then I get log 2 minus 2329 over 3360. Um, and if I evaluate that, that's of order 10 to the minus 5. Okay, so, so, uh, so here's again the, our, our very toy model. I'll give you a, a better toy model in a second. But this is our object to begin with. Okay, this is some, some observable in the analogy. Some observable is just this integral. Um, uh, it's obviously numerically a tiny number, uh, very obviously numerically tiny number, but that tiny number is necessarily made of two different pieces that are sort of number theoretically different. There's a rational piece and a transcendental piece, and, uh, and they're guaranteed to have a huge cancellation. One, uh, uh, and, and therefore in that presentation, they each come with order one coefficients, and, uh, but they'll come out in a way that looks like there's an, a humongous cancellation between the uh, two of them. All right. <clears throat> By the way, exactly the same idea. Uh, uh, I, I illustrated for log two, but if you want to you know, impress your friends at a party, uh, you can look at this integral instead. If you now look at dx over one plus x squared, um, that integral would give you pi. Uh, if I now, uh, if I now um, wait with this x1 minus x over 4 to, uh, to, a, uh, to the 4n, then uh, already for n equals 1, um, this integral is pi minus 22 over 7, which is the order 10 to the minus 3. So this is the sort of high school approximation for pi that you all know. And so uh, the reason 22 over 7 is such a good approximation to pi is exactly this same mechanism. Okay? Uh, if you put n equals 2, you get an even better approximation for pi and so on. And exactly the same mechanism also explains the pi squared minus 9 in, uh, in the lifetime of positronium example. It turns out that uh, in those calculations, there's a phase space integral. The phase space integral is exactly an integral of this form. It has an x, 1 minus x. It vanishes at so many places that it's obvious ahead of time the phase space integral is, is very small. But by precisely the same reason, it is built out of different pieces uh, some piece that have uh, residues, some piece that don't. And so when you decompose this obviously small thing into pieces, it's pi squared minus nine. Okay, so it's the same phenomenon of the cancellation between transcendental and rational. All right, so that's the basic idea. And now let me uh, say what the strategy is here for, for, for the Higgs. Okay, so um, uh, this is really combining, uh, uh, combining the, the, the previous vague ideas that we've been uh, talking about into one. Um, again, the, 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 the rough picture is some integral, uh, perhaps it's associated with integrals over some geometry is like these associahedra or amphotahedra or whatever. That already gives us some, some picture 
of amplitudes and volumes of some geometric object. So maybe there's something like that even more generally uh, and more realistically in, in the standard model. So that means that there's some presentation of these observables that does not start off life looking like a field theory calculation, but some way of uh, uh, unpackaging it will make it look manifestly like a field theory calculation. Um, and so, uh, so uh, the idea is that when we imagine doing a coleman weinberg calculation, we're imagining doing a Euclidean integral like this with some f of k squared. Um, but we want to somehow modify this f of k squared in such a way that th this is an integral over a, a Euclidean domain. So here I've written what a, a, a Euclidean domain looks like. Um, outside the Euclidean domain, in the Lorentzian domain, this function might have poles and so on. And we want those Lorentzian poles to be completely unaffected. So we want them to, 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 to be exactly what they ordinarily are. And so we just want a modification in here in the, uh, in the uh, Euclidean domain, um, uh, such that it's manifestly exponentially small, but, um, but, any, uh, but, but any explicit evaluation of it will represent it as a log plus something rational. And we're going to think about the logs as coming from a Coleman-Weinberg calculation and the rational as being a polynomial piece that's sitting there at tree level already. Okay, so this would be the kind of basic starting point that maybe comes from speculating. Speculating comes from some geometry or something, some dual formulation. Uh, it's obviously exponentially small, but it's going to be unpackaged into something that looks like Coleman-Weinberg plus tree level. And in this formulation, it will appear to have a huge cancellation between the two terms, all right? So let me give you a concrete example. There's actually, uh, there, there's, there's, there's uh, nicer looking examples where they take slightly longer to explain. So I just want to give you the very, very simplest uh, working example of this kind of uh, phenomenon, okay? So let me define uh, F of H, H is going to be the H value, as, uh, uh, as this integral, okay? Um, and uh, and you'll, you'll notice uh, I have some x to the fourth here, some x minus h to the fourth. Uh, I've basically used this so it's as uh, similar to the previous log two example as, as, as we can get, all right? Uh, and I'm gonna define v of h as f of h plus f of minus h. This is really very much like what we get from, uh, uh, from well, when we do a Coleman-Weinberg calculation of a Higgs coupled to fermions, we split the fermions into two. Uh, and so it's the contribution of the heavier one and the lighter one. All right, so, um, so, so this is the Higgs potential. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm gonna modulate again with exactly the same idea, the exactly the same x1 minus x over two to the f. The point is that the residues here at x equals minus one are going to give me things that look like one plus or minus h to the fourth log one plus or minus h. See, if I put x equals minus one here, the residue on x equals minus one exactly gives me something that looks like a Coleman-Weinberg uh, calculation. Uh, I'm working in units where the mass of this heavy fermion is one. Okay, so, so that, that's, that's the one there. So it's manifest that there's a part here with logs that looks exactly like a Coleman-Weinberg calculation. And then the rest is gonna be rational. The rest looks like some sort of three level piece that's sitting there already. So whatever this expression is, it's guaranteed to look like a legal, it's guaranteed to be interpreted as a legal field theory calculation with some rational pieces sitting there already and some one loop uh, correction coming from some massive particle. But whatever it is, it's guaranteed ahead of time to look fine too. And here's a concrete example. If I take n equals five, this is what I literally get. I take n equals five uh, and I shove it into this integral. Uh, uh, here you see is the Coleman-Weinberg piece. Here's what looks like uh, uh, Coleman-Weinberg. And here's a very, very special looking polynomial in, in H, okay? And if you now take this and expand at, for small h, you get uh, vacuum energy, you get a mass squared. And what are they? The vacuum energy is 10 to the minus six. The mass squared is 10 to the minus five. It's this huge cancellation that we talked about. Actually, in this example, there's something kind of cool that the Higher corrections are at zero until you get to something of order h to the 10th. 10 here is two times five. Okay, if I put n equals 10 here, I would have corrections advanced till I got to order uh, h to the 20, right? So, uh, so this is at least a, a concrete example of how this kind of uh, tuning can work. 
And again, uh, it's almost the opposite of what we normally say. We normally say, how could it possibly be that things that have nothing to do with each other, a, a, a tree piece and the calculable pieces from massive particles of the logs, how could they cancel? That's exactly the point here, is that there's, a, there's one basic object that's obviously exponentially small, but, but it, it, it forces itself to be unpackaged into different pieces with the log in it and with the polynomial rational tree in it. And in that unpackaging, there is necessarily apparently a huge fine tuning between the uh, two. All right. So, um, so of course we'd like to go further. So this is a kind of a toy model calculation of the Higgs potential. We'd like to go further and come up with a toy model for the for you know general processes, momentum dependent processes involving the Higgs and so on. The real asset test here is to be able to come up with a with a good enough toy model that we can do calculations, for example, for the correction to Higgs glue glue or to gamma gamma and so on. So that's the sort of thing that we're playing with now. But I just wanted to give you the the sort of the just the zeroth order picture for what uh, for for what the uh, idea is for where these apparent tunings could uh, come from. And even independent, I'm just going to say 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 this again. Even independent of any particular models, I hope these examples are illustrating this general point that it's really crucial to probe the Euclidean properties of the Higgs. Um, I, and I've said these things uh, already. Um, it's crucial to see whether uh, uh, whether we can probe, especially the optical couplings of the Higgs to uh, TT bar, both in the corrections uh, to Higgs of glue glue and Higgs of gamma gamma, as well as this uh, uh, shutting off of, uh, of uh, the TT bar Higgs production uh, at large PT. All right, um, it, uh, I've gone on for an hour and 20 minutes and gone over uh, um, basically the half that I wanted to talk about, which I think um, uh, you had not uh, heard about. Uh, so I think I should probably stop there because I, I think uh, Young Do, uh, as, uh, again, I believe has given a talk on, on, on the other stuff. I went more slowly than I, uh, than I imagined. Um, uh, so I think this is a, a good place to stop and see if there are any, any questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, other question? So, so this transcendental tra uh, tuning will work for, for any loops? It's guaranteed? No, for, yeah, I mean, the, uh, you know, um, uh, as I said, the, 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 uh, part one, I mean, everything that I talked about is, uh, it, it, it is just a cartoon of what the calculations might, might look like. If I had something that really worked, it would be a different talk. Uh, so, um, uh, but, I, but I just wanted to give, you know, the, the main thing that I, want, I wanted to counter is that is this sort of idea that the basic Wilsonian picture just makes it impossible to imagine that something very far away could cancel something nearby, okay? Um, and, and that is just wrong. I mean, we have examples. Uh, we have, I gave you a few basic examples of that phenomenon, not random, Academic examples. They are. They are. They're. They're. They're really related to these. Uh, the, in. In. In the sort of first part where I gave you the examples with the. Uh, uh, with the contour and go and so on. That's really. That's really. A, it's a sort of a. It's a ubiquitous, deep, phenomenon about how. Uh, how uh, power law versus exponential soft behavior in the UV can make an order hundred percent difference in the analytic structure of, uh, of uh, interesting observables. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one, one point. Um, and uh, and in, in the second part, um, uh, you know, in the first part, it was a little extreme. It went from zero to one. Okay, so you might think, okay, maybe something like that is going on, but how are we going to understand why the Higgs mass is, is not, you know, or the cosmological function of the Higgs mass is not exactly zero, but is exponentially small. Um, and uh, so in, in, in the second part, Drawing from this motivation of hidden symmetry, seen in amplitudes, and these different formulations that don't look like Feynman diagrams, and so on, and at least uh, you can wonder: Is it even possible? There's some expression for the Higgs mass that will will make it look explain the tuning. And I've now given you examples where you can see concrete formulas where there's no tuning in the formula, but for a good reason. When you unpackage it to make it look like a field theory calculation, it looks tuned. So, um, uh, so. Uh, presumably, if anything like these things are right, and I think, uh, you know, 
I don't give it a high chance. And so that's why the, 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 this whole first part of the talk is extremely speculative. But if there is something like this going on, um, I think it, uh, 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 we can keep going to, to try and uh, find toy examples at higher loops. So you can certainly try to do that. You can try to come up with, uh, with, uh, with an extension of these integrals that spit out what looks like a two-loop Coleman-Weinberg calculation plus corrections. Uh, and I have toy examples of that, um, of things that look like they have the log squared uh, that you would see at two loops, for example. Um, so that, uh, so, so I think we can, we can come up with, uh, we can come up with toy examples, um, but uh, probably at some point, if there's anything like this, someone just has to, has to find some actual theory, some actual theory and some actual computation in that, uh, in, in that theory. What, 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 what I've been trying to do with this um, is to stick with this one loop example, but try to push it away from a computation just of the Higgs mass to something that has some momentum dependence. And there we have further, uh, we have further constraints. Not only uh, here, our only constraint was that it had to decompose into m to the fourth log m squared plus polynomial. Um, once we have a momentum dependence, we have to have you know correct sign of the residues on poles and and and, and things like that. So I think it'll be interesting to try to extend these to uh, keeping it at one loop, but uh, to more uh, realistic um, uh, momentum dependency. Yeah, thank you. One question concerning, so you were emphasizing that uh, you would uh, need high momentum of shellness of uh, right. tops, which this, right. would this work with low momentum as well? For example, if it would be possible to measure Higgs to off shell TT bar or would the same work for uh, Higgs to BB bar if you could have high precision measurements, for example, at an E plus E minus. Yeah, uh, that, that, I mean, the, the BB bar is uh, interesting. I think, uh, uh, so sorry, the, for your first question, Higgs to TT bar with both tops off shell? Yeah, you mean if we if we had something where, uh, yes, uh, I think, uh, I think, um, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, any any probe where the tops are, uh, are but I think you, you want them off shell by like, like I said, this number of 500 GeV, which is kind of a, 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 an, a an alpha top loop factor above the uh, Higgs mass scale. That's, that's the scale you want to approach. What, 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 what did you have in mind for, for other couplings involving the, uh, the top? No, so, uh, so what I meant was uh, you were going uh, off shell towards high, uh, high PT. Right. Uh, I was thinking about going uh, going off shell to uh, to low PT, i.e., take uh, having virtual tops uh, which are much lighter, uh, but for the LHC Higgs to uh, TT bar with high off shellness, the production cross section is extremely low. But right. in principle, you could have Higgs to BB bar, which at LHC is uh, very hard to measure. Yeah, yeah, I think. But I think if you have Higgs at an E plus E minus collider. Right, um, but I think with the, at least yeah. from uh, you know at least from the rock bottom uh, naturalness considerations, because the the coupling to BB bar is so is so small, I think the like uh, the amount of off shellness you'd need to probe is is a lot higher, right? I, I mean, you know, so that's uh, so I think it's really uh, it's really uh, it's really it's really the uh, the atop that okay. you want to think about. Thank you. But, uh, but I want to emphasize that I think this, this whole question of uh, Higgs TV bar off shell, I mean, that's the last stand of naturalness, totally kind of model independent. Um, it's really the sort of last stand of naturalness and we know very little about it experimentally. Um, so everything, is, you know, if we look for top partners or Higgs compositeness or something, but sort of literally the sort of model independent probe of the TT bar uh, Higgs coupling off shell, um, uh, yeah, I think that's the that just as, as an experimental thing. That's the that's the the last stand of some kind of conventional picture of a naturalness associated with the Higgs. Everything that I was talking about would have some effect of that sort. I mean, I didn't give you concrete models, but the spirit of everything that I told you involves a shut off in the uh, Euclidean form factors that's unaccompanied by anything that you see in Lorentzian signature. Um, so that's why it's not standard compositeness. It's not standard compositeness. It's not unparticled. It's not. Uh, it's it's nothing. It's nothing. Um, the, the whole point is that you don't see some con concomitant change on shell 
given this funny thing that you did off shelf. That's exactly the sense in which the Euclidean Lorentzian continuation is being messed with. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that, that's why it's, uh, I think, uh, model independently an, an important thing to look at. So I have, I have one question. Um, so for the, uh, this uh, uh, UVIR stuff, I remember there was some uh, study of UVIR correspondence and also minimal length uh, uncertainty principle, et cetera. <clears throat> Do you think that those kind of setups uh, fit to your idea or not? No, no I mean, uh, minimal not. length is not UVIR. That's just some mm. kind of, uh, uh, you know, that's like some kind of lattice, UV cutoff, and so on. That's, yeah. that's not that. Um, there, there have been, I mean, the, the, there's a field theoretic context in which UVIR was discussed uh, in the context of non commutative geometry. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's a non gravitational setting where you can study some of these things. Um, and the, the sort of basic model is really simple. So if you imagine that you have uh, an electric dipole, like imagine you have a plus and a minus charge connected by a spring, okay? And now turn on a magnetic field. What happens as this thing moves more and more quickly in the magnetic field is that it gets bigger, right? Because mm. the uh, be, uh, because uh, uh, they're they're being uh, they want to go in opposite directions by the magnetic field. And so if you take this electric dipole and you move it in a constant magnetic field, it grows in size, right? So that's the that's the basic model um, uh, of uh, of going to higher energies, making an object get bigger. But you see, very importantly, it's that you turn on a magnetic field. If you sort of break Lorentz invariance, you turn on a magnetic field. Um, and so uh, that whole subject, basically, of turning on a magnetic field um, is a uh, uh, non commutative geometry that was studied actively by Seberg and, uh, and, and Witten in the late 90s. And various people, Nate Craig and others, sort of went, went back to it recently to kind of look at it through this uh, hierarchy problem lens. Um, but uh, uh, so th that's a concrete field theoretic example where you can really do calculations and see the sort of UVIR connection. There. But the reason for the UVIR connection is very manifestly tied to the breaking of Lorentz invariance. Again, it's this magnetic field that you turn on and the dipole just grows in size as it moves through this magnetic field. Mm. Um, the way in which the, the UVIR connection shows up in gravity is much more subtle and interesting than that. I mean, qualitatively, it's this thing that I said in the beginning, very high energy collisions give you make larger and larger black holes. Um, and it shows up in the fact that the high energy amplitudes are exponentially soft instead of power law. Um, that exponential softness is the, is the characteristic of gravity and not a field theory. And it's exactly that exponential softness that, that makes this difference in my first set of examples between these quantities that go from being zero to one, depending on whether you do or don't turn on these, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, we, we, depending on whether you do or don't have uh, have gravity, so yeah. something uh, something that you change up at M Planck changes the value of some uh, of some computation from zero to one. Um, uh, I think uh, that that's closer. I mean, that's sort of a deep thing, and it's closer to what we what we uh, care about. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, so I think that the 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 challenge in in any of the, these things that I was talking about today, um, I'm just uh, repeating myself, is to come up with an expression. Uh, it doesn't matter how you get it, whether you have a model, you have a picture, blah, blah, it doesn't matter. You want some formula that you have some formula that gives you uh, some expression for physical processes that depend on external momenta in some way and so on. They have to have the property that the, that the discontinuities uh, the imaginary parts are all correct. That's unitarity. They have to have the property that uh, that uh, that you know their appropriate behavior as a function of momentum on the complex plane uh, is analytic enough. That's uh, that's uh, causality. Um, but they should they should net with things enough um, in the Euclidean domain uh, where we don't have any of these constraints on them um, uh, to 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 alter uh, our expectation of what the Euclidean contribution is from naturalness. Again, we're very much leveraging the fact that, that there is no inconsistency with having a fine-tuned Higgs or a fine-tuned cosmological concept. It's just that we can't imagine in any of the theories that we have for calculating them, any theory that we have that calculates the Higgs mass, 
or that, that makes it calculable or makes the cost module constant calculable, all such theories, when we make them calculable, we find that, uh, that uh, unless we have lots of new physics at the weak scale, there would be, uh, it would need huge cancellation, right? So, um, but it's also true that every model that we've had of this sort has been, you know, one way or another in the neighborhood of uh, standard local field theory. And so it's, it's conceivable that there are, uh, that there's other representations that, that don't, that don't begin as looking like local field theory, but they're perfectly compatible with it in the end, that will just give a rationalization for uh, where this theming tuning comes from. Okay, so that, that, that was really the, the theme of the second part of the talk, is just give you concrete examples of how that might happen. By the way, I should say, this, uh, th this is a well-known thing in, uh, in, in math, that, uh, that the, the, and in fact, uh, uh, a reason this has been, this kind of phenomenon has been studied a lot in math is that there's a strategy for proving that numbers are irrational. Never mind transcendental, but a strategy for proving that a certain number is irrational is to find um, uh, a, a outstandingly good rational uh, approximations to it. So it's kind of an ironic thing. If you want to prove that a certain number is irrational, the way to prove that it's irrational is to find a sequence of p over q's um, that better and better approximate it, um, so that the difference between your number and p over q. Uh, uh, is actually smaller than one over q. Actually, goes like one over q squared uh, as you go to large q. If you can do that, then your number is actually irrational. So if you find if you find extremely good uh, rational approximations to a certain number, that actually lets you prove that it's irrational. So this is why uh, mathematicians cared about finding these very good rational approximations to uh, irrational numbers, and um, essentially. Uh, a, a kind of a, 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 a more, a, a somewhat decorated version of the story that I told you about log two was, was used in a famous proof in the late 1970s by the mathematician Aperi for the fact that the, the number zeta of three, you know, one over one squared plus one over, two, one over one cubed plus two cubed plus three cubed plus four cubed, um, zeta of three was only proven to be irrational in the late 1970s. And it was proven to be irrational by a variant of exactly this log two type argument. So you, you, you came up with some integral, uh, at least the, the modern ways of thinking about what it is, is really to come up with some integral like that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that you write in, in a way that's manifestly exponentially small, but which another representation is zeta three minus a rational number that is a better and better approximation to, uh, uh, to that, that gives you a good enough approximation to a zeta of three. So, so this phenomenon of, uh, of uh, uh, transcendental rational cancellation <coughs> is one that's been studied um, uh, a lot over the last uh, century. And uh, I, I find particularly interesting that uh, as in, in updates of this uh, and clarifications and better conceptual understandings of these things um, by a number of theorists over the last uh, 10, 20 years, um, have actually related the underlying integrals that give rise to these zeta numbers to string amplitudes. So there's a connection to uh, there's a connection to a physics um, uh, uh, as well. So uh, and it, so it's not accidental. You know the, the 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 numbers that we see in physics that come out of amplitude calculations, logs, dialogs, zeta values. These are ubiquitously important number theoretic things. Um, and so. Uh, Anyway, so 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 I'm I'm just saying that this is not a totally random example. The sort of phenomenon is uh, is an is an important one that has been seen in a number of settings over the past uh, century and a half. I have a hello. I have a question. I'm yes. I'm Hyunmin. Hi. Hi. Uh, you talked about the cancellation in the amplitude in the first part. In the second yeah. part, you have a can extra cancellation in the uh, hermann weinberg potential. So can you right. make a connection between the two? Suppose you have a cancellation in the logarithms in the Kolmann-Weinberg potential. Can you imagine yeah. such a cancellation uh, in the amplitude calculation, for instance? For oh, us? yeah. Uh, that, uh, as I said, I, I, I can imagine it, but I don't yet have a direct connection between the, uh, the uh, two of them. Um, uh, but. Um, uh, but as I said, that, that the, it, I find it striking that these hidden symmetries, I mean, and these are really hidden symmetries of Yang-Mills amplitudes and of phi-cubed amplitudes. 
that there's particular directions in uh, in momentum space for the external momentum now. So that that's the difference, right? In these common Weinberg calculations, there's something going on in like internal loop momentum space. Here I'm saying, forget about that. If you look at tree amplitudes or the loop integrands for gluons or uh, the, or the or the phi cube theory, there are directions in momentum space where every Feynman diagram would naively even grow with energy, but the sum of all of them magically uh, vanish. And uh, what makes them vanish is this hidden symmetry, mm -hmm. is this dual conformal symmetry, or, or in the phi cube uh, case, what we call this uh, projective index. So, uh, yeah, it would be. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a direct connection yet, but that, that the fact that that's actually a, a fact about totally non-supersymmetric theories <laughs> have mm -hmm. this magical property at infinite momentum, it's some inspiration for trying to do something uh, mm -hmm. like this. Yeah. As yeah. I said in the beginning, it, it's an unusual talk. I'm not giving you, there are not physics models, right? There, there, it's, uh, uh, there are sort of fantasies for what a model might look like, but they're not, uh, they're not, you know, I would say they're wild fantasies, but they're not key to the wild fantasies. <laughs> they're just, they're moderately wild uh, fantasies. Mm -hmm. uh, may I ask you, um, I understand uh, many of us did not hear the talk by Hyundo. And so oh, okay. we would like to know what is the connection of what you said up to now with the with that uh, development. Oh, it's a, that's a totally different thing. Uh, I mean, I, I, oh, I, I don't know. It's not related. To, um, yeah, it's a completely different thing. Uh, it's a, uh, that's a, um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, if, if people are interested in hearing something about that, I can, uh, I can maybe you speak can 15 just, or 20 you, minutes about it. But um, if you can but, just say something can, intuitive, uh, because, uh, for example, I didn't even read the talk, so I would like to know what is the idea behind. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, what? Uh, uh, perhaps we can do the following thing. Um, uh, uh, do we want to sort of officially stop and, and clap for me, uh, and then uh, and then um, uh, if anyone is uh, interested, we can. I'll just take another. Uh, 15 minutes or so and explain yeah, what was in that just, part of the talk. Just to say that. Is, is that yes, okay with no. people? I, but I, I don't want to trap people who want to leave. So even though it's Zoom and in principle you could leave whenever you want, but uh, uh, should we just clap for me? Clap, clap, clap. Okay. Okay, good. Clap, clap. And then, um, Thank you. Good? I have, I have one more question. Uh, yes. So you, you briefly mentioned about this uh, momentum dependence at one loop. So, uh, so uh, does this imply that the, uh, the, the LGE equation of Higgs couplings will ah, change? Above? Excellent question. Absolutely. In fact, beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, it would. Yes, yes, it would. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, if I, I, I give you the most toy example of the Coleman-Weinberg. There is the nicest example of the Coleman-Weinberg uh, that I have uh, exactly has this very interesting property that uh, that even the common Weinberg part from the top is unaffected. So you'd have, you know, so you would have h to the fourth log h squared, but there would be this, there would be this sort of magical cancellation from an infinite set of polynomial terms that do an excellent job of canceling that. So that the effective running of the coupling would look different. So that's another qualitative thing. So if we could measure the running of the Yukawa couplings, of the Higgs self coupling and so on, uh, then that would be another measure of exactly the sort of thing that I was talking about. In fact, I had a slide on that and I just forgot to uh, get, okay. get to yeah, it. That's what I thought. Okay, Indeed, thank you very much. The, the entire, but that's, but that's uh, the entire Wilsonian renormalization group is a totally Euclidean phenomenon. It's a totally Euclidean thing. And so absolutely, if we're affecting things uh, off shell, then you, we would expect the running of those couplings to be affected. So that's a strong motivation to try to measure the running of all the couplings involving the Higgs. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, thanks for bringing it up because I, I yeah, I, I was going to mention it and I just forgot to mention it on, 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 on the slide. Okay, uh, have we all clapped? Have we given everyone an opportunity who wants to leave to leave? I can close my eyes and, and go, go, go get coffee or something if people want to want to leave. No? Okay. All right, so uh, so then, uh, uh, then maybe I'll just take a few minutes and tell you about uh, the other part of the talk. Okay, all right. So, um, okay. So, so this is a totally different subject. Okay. So it's uh, uh, much more conventional and concrete. Still a little bit wacky, but uh, but it's a very con con concrete model. All right. So, um, 
So let's begin with a very different question. Um, uh, uh, you know, all the drama about the hierarchy problem is uh, why is the Higgs mass squared small? So let's begin with a very simple question. What happens if we take the standard model and we vary m Higgs squared? Okay, what actually depends on m Higgs squared? Um, if I said more offensively, what correlation functions actually depend on m Higgs squared? And you say, well, that's the stupidest question in the world. Obviously everything depends on m Higgs squared. The spectrum depends on m Higgs squared. Okay, that's good. The spectrum depends on m, m, m Higgs squared, but what is the spectrum? What measures the spectrum are, for example, two-point functions. I look at a propagator, I look at a pole in the propagator to determine the electron mass or something like that, okay? So, so in other words, um, it's two-point functions uh, in uh, position space or O, o as a function of uh, P squared in momentum space that depends on m Higgs squared. But if you ask, are there any local operators that just depend on x, any O of x, so it's translation invariant, so any just VAB of O, is there any operator just whose local operator whose vacuum expectation value depends on the Higgs mass squared? Uh, the answer, very interestingly, um, and this is totally well known, but, but it's a point that I want to begin uh, uh, emphasizing, um, uh, uh, are not. They, they don't depend on m Higgs squared. In fact, in the standard model, they're not calculable. And this is one of the, this is actually a sharp characterization of the hierarchy problem. One of uh, a number of related sharp parameterizations of the hierarchy problem. For example, you might think in the standard model, most naively, the expectation value of h dagger h depends on m Higgs squared. And it's true at tree level. If the uh, Higgs mass squared is positive, h dagger h is zero. If the Higgs mass squared is negative, h dagger h is given by basically the value of uh, mh squared, if you make it negative. Um, but at loop level, it's not true anymore. Um, for example, if I try to compute the expectation value of h dagger h, then here's an insertion of the operator uh, h dagger h, and I close the usual uh, hierarchy problem loop, and I find something which is power divergent. And in fact, this is true for all the other local, almost, I'll give you the one counter example, almost all local operators. For example, what is the value of the Yukawa coupling? Well, I do the same thing. I, I insert, here's the, here's the operator, there's Q, H, U conjugate, and I close it exactly with Yukawa. So this gives me something that goes like Yukawa cut off to the fourth, okay? These local operators are not, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, they're all dominated by physics in the UV, and therefore totally insensitive to what mh squared actually is. So said another way, um, uh, imagine very weakly coupling the operators that we're interested in to some scalar field phi, okay? So, uh, um, so for example, let me weakly couple Higgs dagger Higgs to some scalar field phi. And so, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna imagine this coupling is really minuscule, phi is nearly a massless field. Um, and so what I'm interested in is what is the low energy effective action for phi after I integrate everything out in the standard model. And well, again, the usual things we say is that, look, this, this operator has exactly the same symmetries as epsilon phi, some, some cutoff scale squared. And uh, we would just say that therefore this linear term in the potential is not calculable. Mu as a parameter we'll have to take from experiment. And again, the conventional picture of naturalness would, would tell us that the uh, uh, mu is of order this epsilon times the uh, cutoff square, okay? So it's not calculable. Uh, that means that the, that the expectation of H dagger H is not calculable in the standard model. Um, it means that, uh, that this low energy effective potential for phi is not calculable in the standard model if I coupled uh, H dagger H to phi. These are all different ways of saying the same thing. And in fact, this is another aspect of the hierarchy problem. Um, uh, normally, we say the hierarchy problem becomes sharply posed in theories where you can actually calculate the Higgs mass squared parameter. In the standard model, we have to take it from experiment. So whether or not you say there's a hierarchy problem, maybe we can have infinitely many philosophical debates about that, but I don't even care. Um, the, the hierarchy problem acquires teeth, it becomes sharp in a theory that purports to calculate the Higgs mass squared parameter, not just take it from experiment. Um, and in such a theory, then, in all such theories, which do calculate it, we see the, the, the usual description of the uh, hierarchy problem uh, uh, concretely. In exactly the same theories, uh, we can similarly ask um, whether we make H dagger H calculable. 
And in all the things we know and love that make the Higgs mass squared calculable, also the expectation value of H stagger H becomes calculable. And in fact, the ratio of H stagger H to the, to the Higgs mass squared is then a very precise notion of tuning. It has nothing to do with like aesthetics or so on. It's just that these are two things that we can now make calculable. And uh, to the extent that they're far apart from each other, the theory is more, more tuned. Okay. Anyway, that, that's a side, side comment. So, um, so this is just, just interesting in the standard model. There are no local operators that care about the uh, Higgs mass squared parameter. Okay. Uh, the two point functions and so on care, but local operators don't seem to uh, care about it at all. So um, at tree level, we could say that H dagger H does care. At tree level, we could say the operator H dagger H is triggered when the Higgs mass squared crosses zero, where the Higgs mass squared is positive, it's zero, and then it gets triggered when the Higgs mass squared crosses zero. However, quantum mechanically, it's not. At loop level, it's not triggered uh, at all, okay? Now, there's one um, famous exception in the standard model, which is the operator trace glue glue dual, okay? Um, again, uh, famously, trace glue glue dual is a total derivative. So naively, the expectation value is zero uh, because it's a total derivative, but uh, it's, a, it's a total derivative of something that's not gauge invariant. And in fact, we can turn it on in, in instanton background, et cetera. So, so for good reason, in all tolerance and perturbation theory, the expectation value of trace glue glue, glue, glue dual is zero, but not perturbatively, it's, it's uh, non-zero. And the fact that it's given by lambda QCD cube times uh, M up. Um, and both lambda QCD cubed and, of course, M up uh, depend on M H squared. So this is an operator that is triggered by uh, M H squared. If you imagine sort of uh, plotting trace GG dual, the function of M H squared, it changes radically uh, when M H squared uh, crosses zero. All right, and that fact that trace glue glue dual uh, is, is triggered by uh, uh, electric symmetry breaking is used then in cosmological scenarios like the relaxion, for example, to say something about the uh, hierarchy problem. But I'm not gonna be going down that route in the rest of this talk. Instead, I want to ask whether there are other operators that can be triggered by electric symmetry breaking. And in the, in the standard model itself, the answer is no. And we just talked, we know what all the symmetries are. The, the, why glue glue dual is special because of the anomaly. Um, but uh, it is possible to find operators that are triggered by electric symmetry breaking in very simple extensions of the standard model with two Higgs doublets. So imagine a two Higgs doublet model. Um, and now with two Higgses, H1 and H2. And let's assign H1 and H2 some Peche Quinn charges such that the, the, the usual bilinear H1, H2 has charge minus one. So I want this the whole thing to have charge minus one under uh, PQ. Um, uh, for, for phenomenological safety, I'm going to imagine that only H2 couples to the standard model fermions and H1 does not. So that, that, that defines the like PQ charge, charge assignments. Okay. Um, and now let me ask the, uh, the question about the expectation. Oh, that's not H up, H down, that's H1, H2. It's only H2 couples to a uh, standard model fermion. So let's, let's try to do the same thing and ask about the expectation of H1, H2. And now you see the problem that, that I had before, I can't close the loop, okay? Because of exactly of the uh, uh, Petre Quinn uh, symmetry that I've imposed, I can't close this loop. Uh, and in fact, the expectation of H1, H2 becomes calculable again. Okay, because it's charged under this PQ symmetry. So what is it? So th this is the picture at tree level. Okay, so obviously this is a, a trivial thing. In order for the H1, H2 to turn on, I have to have the both M1 squared and M2 squared are negative. If even one of them is positive at tree level, uh, the, the, the product of the two valves, only one of them gets a valve and the product is, uh, uh, the product is zero. So there's a sort of a, a phase diagram that both M1 squared and M2 squared have to be negative, and then this operator uh, uh, turns on. Okay, so we have to have both of them uh, negative in order to trigger H1, H2. The story is actually a little more interesting uh, non-perturbatively uh, because QCD also will break, uh, uh, parallel symmetry breaking also breaks this uh, PQ symmetry. I don't have time to explain this in more detail. So, so um, uh, Due to effects of uh, uh, lambda QCD, the, the actual picture is uh, slightly more interesting. But basically, uh, uh, 
for for the, for the all intents and purposes of, of the rest of the talk, it, it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, really effective. It's still true that in order to have this thing turn on in a sizable way, um, uh, we have to have the both m1 squared and m2 squared are are negative. Now I haven't told you why we care about turning on h1 h2. I'm just sort of telling you a fact that uh, that um, that in the standard model, apart from Google, Google, nothing cares about. No local operator cares about very, whether you vary uh, uh, mh squared. Um, but in a two exoplanet model with this PQ symmetry, with this uh, symmetry that flips h1 h2, um, then uh, this operator h1 h2 only turns on when both Higgs mass squares are negative. So it does care about uh, it does care about uh, electric symmetry there. In a moment, we're going to use this in a sort of cosmological scenario that's going to uh, I the cosmological constant and the Higgs mass um, uh, in, an, in an interesting way. So we're going to use this fact in a moment to do something. Okay, but um, but uh, but to begin with, I'm just making the sort of simple comment that uh, that um, uh, that in a two-exoplanet model we can have the weak scale as a trigger in a way that we can't in the standard model, with the exception of this uh, uh, blue blue dual operator. Okay, so now of course this PQ symmetry must be broken. Otherwise, we have a weak scale axion. And the uh, conventional way that this is done, I don't know why I keep writing HUHD here. The conventional way that this is done, uh, for example, you, you imagine having a B term in the two exoplanet potential, BH1H2. But we can't have that. If we have a B term, that would ruin this trigger mechanism. Because, uh, because then, uh, if I'm looking at the expectation value of H up, H down again, now I can close this loop with B. Okay. Um, and again, uh, the size of this would be independent of M1 squared and M2 squared. So it would be just as bad as what we had before, uh, uh, essentially as bad as what we had before in the standard model. Okay, so um, in other words, uh, if I want this operator to only turn on when the Higgs mass squared cross zero, uh, I can't have a B term. Okay. Um, all right, so that pushes us into an interesting uh, corner of the two exoplanet model. And there's a giant literature on two exoplanet models, uh, and I'm sure somewhere in that literature that this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, this corner with the symmetry has been talked about. Um, uh, but we have we don't know explicitly where it's been uh, talked about before. And in any case, the, the 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 really interesting thing is that the, which I'll say in, I'm going to say now. Uh, uh, is the sort of phenomenology of this in the year 2021? Okay, so it's not. Uh, um, so, but maybe anyway, let me define what 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 the model is. So, um, so we want to have a two exoplanet model where the Peche Quinn is broken to a Z2 or technically a Z4 symmetry. Uh, it, it doesn't really mean you can even think of this Z2, just where H1 H2 picks up a charge minus one. So B is zero. That's the crucial thing. Is that B is zero? But I'm going to break the PQ to a Z4. Uh, and get rid of the weak scale axion by adding this quartic coupling. Okay, so this H1, H2 squared. So the PQ is broken, but crucially, under the symmetry under which, uh, under this, uh, 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 under this uh, Z4 symmetry, this coupling lambda uh, now has Peche Quinn charge minus two, whereas H1, H2 itself has Peche Quinn charge minus one. And therefore, because uh, 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 because a lambda has charge two and is even, H one H two can never be generated by any uh, by by any sort of uh, uh, spurion expansion in lambda, and uh, and so uh, that means that H one H two is always calculable. There is no uh, there is no uh, there is no ultraviolet contribution to H one H two that involves some expression made out of lambdas and other things. Um, uh, the only way to get uh, 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 the only way to turn on H1 H2 is for uh, M1 squared and M2 squared to both be negative. Okay, so so that's that's the uh, that's the uh, two exoplanet model. Uh, so we, we called it just uh, just to be cheeky the type zero two exoplanet model. Um, uh, and so again, this is uh, uh, summarizing what it is just in the Higgs potential um, is we have these the quartic couplings, and this is the only PQ breaking. Uh, that we have, which has charge two, and nothing of charge one. And uh, and I think here's the most interesting thing. Um, uh, uh, even before getting to what we're going to use this for to deal with the hierarchy problem, but 
Uh, this two x doublet model is impossible to decouple. That, that, so, so if for any reason um, we think the weak scale should be triggered by something, and that has something to do with the hierarchy problem. So, so we care about the value of the Higgs mass squared because we want the separator to turn on for some reason. So that means that we have to bring the the uh, we, we we have to bring the mass squares down across zero and so on. So we're going to talk about a reason that'll happen. Uh, a reason to do that in a second, but. But more independently than what that uh, reason is, um, in order to make the weak scale a trigger in the Stuart exhibit model, we have to have the symmetry. That symmetry means the B term is zero. And that means that the spectrum is impossible to decouple. There is no limit where I can make the mass squares, uh, uh, the mass squares of the other Higgs is uh, arbitrarily big. The reason is that we must have both Higgs mass squares to be negative. So, uh, that means that both Higgs have to participate in electroweak symmetry breaking in order not to be wildly ruled out. So like that of the, uh, the above of the, um, the uh, uh, so we have the V1 and uh, V2. V2 is ours. V1 is the, the, the new guy. Roughly speaking, this ratio of above should be less than a third. So the, the ratio of the squares is less than 10%. Uh, the new uh, neutral Higgs states must be lighter than 100 GeV. Everyone else has got to be, you can't make them heavier than 150 or 200 GeV. There's no decoupling limit at all because without the B term, the only way to uh, uh, make the states heavier is to use the quartic coupling. And we can't make the quartic coupling too big without hitting the Landau pole right away, even at the TeV scale. Okay. So, uh, so the uh, biggest uh, collider physics surprise is that this corner of the two x doublet model, again, I summarize, is just where the only breaking of P2 is in the quartic coupling of charge two, and the B term is zero, okay? This is a limit of the two x doublet model where the weak scale becomes a trigger by the operator H1, H2, and you cannot get rid of the Higgs states at all. And you would surely have thought that we know so much about the Higgs sector already that uh, we can definitely rule this out. But uh, and we, we looked as carefully as we could with all the searches that are out there. Remarkably, it seems to be alive. Um, there is a not terribly tuned region of the parameter space of this two x doublet model that escapes all uh, that escapes all the current um, uh, 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 probes. Um, it will it will really intensively be probed at the high lumina at the high lumi run of the LHC. And if anything like this is going on, there will be huge signals at a Higgs factor, and uh, and uh, you know we, we could have a whole talk talking about this, uh, uh, or or you know half an hour talking about all the different searches that go on into these spots. But this is just giving you a rough idea of what I mean when I say it's not ruled out. This is uh, the the kind of region of the parameter space of this model, which is alive, is in white, um, and this is uh, plotted, I, I think, in, uh, in in a reasonable plane. Of the of the mass of the of the uh, new CP even Higgs um, uh, as a function of the the ratio of the of the VEVs or uh, um, uh, uh, and for different values of the charge sig masses. Okay, and so you see the white is alive. So there are all kinds of regions. You know, this is they're not big the regions uh, which are alive. Uh, there are there 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 there. Uh, uh, Plenty of regions uh, where there's nothing alive at all, but there are these. There are regions um, which are uh, which are just not covered by, which are not yet yet covered, and it's hard to uh, quantify. It's still a kind of big parameter space, but I'd say that sort of 10, 20 percent of the parameter space is not yet dead. Um, uh, it's not. It, it's definitely not all of it. It's not one percent of it. There's some healthy region of the parameter space which is not yet uh, not yet dead. Okay, um, and so, uh, and anyway, I'm, I was struck by that, that, that we can really still have in the year 2021, uh, you know, uh, 70 GV second, this whole two x doublet sector sitting there um, and, and escape everything from LEP uh, to the LHC uh, so far. Again, this is a very, very interesting subject. We spend a long time talking about all these searches, but that's the, that's the summary uh, uh, so far. Um, and now let me just give you a picture for what we would, uh, uh, how we could use this to um, explain the, uh, 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 at least uh, how we could use this trigger uh, to give, uh, to give a sort of a new uh, approach 
to the hierarchy problem. Okay. All right. So, uh, so we're going to do this in the context of thinking about um, uh, a landscape of vacua uh, for um, for getting us a small cosmological constant. So this is going to be a picture. We're going to sort of correlate the smallness of the cosmological constant and the uh, Higgs mass. And and here is the the picture. So uh, you know you you've all probably heard of uh, you know lots and lots of uh, blah blah words about the uh, landscape, but there's a very very simple model for a landscape, which is the following. So imagine you have one scalar field, a sort of a generic scalar field, uh, with uh, two minima. So you know so it's phi to the fourth plus some mu phi cubed plus m squared phi squared. So some generic potential. Now imagine. Uh, now imagine I have a bunch of these. So lambda i, mu i, m squared i. So here's one of them. Uh, here's another one. Here's another one, and so on. Okay. Um, now the second, and they all have the shape, but the parameters are not identical. Okay. So that's um, uh, then. If you have n of these scalars, there are two to the n vacua. Okay, because each one can be in one of these, and so. What do they look like? If I look at the vacuum energies, I have two to the n vacua here. So there's two to the n vacua. Uh, and okay, well, zero is in here somewhere. And so whether you like it or not, there's going to be a vacuum here whose, uh, whose energy is of order two to the minus n times whatever the cutoff of the theory is uh, to the fourth. Okay, so that's the, the like zero order aspect of the landscape. Before we talk anything about the multiverse and eternal inflation and all these other confusing things um, is that, uh, and now we don't need string theory. We don't need all, all the rest of the stuff. All we have to do is imagine, we can even imagine there's one unique vacuum of the world, but that vacuum happens to have, you know, 500 scalar fields like this. Then even though the Lagrangian is unique, um, uh, that unique Lagrangian would give us two to the 500 minima, whether we like it or not, okay? Um, and, uh, the, uh, and the point is the number of vacuum is exponential in the number of fields. Okay, and so that at least makes it possible that there is a vacuum with a small enough cosmological constant, even without any doing any fine tuning of the parameters of the Lagrangian. I've got a very generic Lagrangian, but just with 500 fields, and that would guarantee that, that there is some vacuum in there which has small enough uh, vacuum energy. Of course, there's two of the 500 other ones, um, but some has very small uh, vacuum energy. Then there's a separate question how did we end up here? Could we live other places, et cetera, et cetera. That, but I'm going to put all those things aside. Um, uh, this would make it possible for there to be a vacuum with small enough vacuum energy without doing any fine adjustment of the parameters of the theory. Okay, so that's just sort of a field theoretic model of a landscape. And uh, uh, Simon Kotcher and Savas Samopoulos and I, 15 years ago, you know, uh, did some model building with these things we call them friendly landscapes uh, back then. Um, uh, it just gives us sort of a, a concrete model to have in mind for how you could play with a landscape. Now, mostly people imagine that these landscape fields, and actually the, the landscape of string theory is very much like these toy examples. Okay, so there are people talking about brains and fluxes. But you can think about these brains as being domain walls in these uh, in these uh, scalar models, and in, in, in various guises, they're literally like that. Okay? So this is not far from the actual string landscape. Um, it's a good toy model for thinking about the uh, string uh, landscape, if you like. Um, now, most of the people imagine that these landscape fields are up at the string scale or gut scale, and everything is like super duper heavy. Um, and uh, the, the first point to, uh, to say about uh, this is that um, uh, th this is an, an aspect of the physics of the landscape that is not metaphysics, is not philosophy. If uh, you could imagine that you built a collider uh, that got up to, let's say, the gut scale, um, and it just produced these 500 scalars. And you could imagine that by detailed measurements, you could see that each one had a potential that looked like that, that looked just like the one that we talked about. So in other words, you could verify from experiments in our universe that we have these landscape scalars and that they have two different minima. You could even, by experiments in our universe, make a bubble of all the other two of the 500 vacua. You couldn't make the bubble too big, but you could definitely make a, a healthy bubble where you could shoot a probe inside and see that indeed the constants change and everything changes and come, 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 come back out. Okay? So that aspect of the landscape is not metaphysics. A, it makes it possible to find a vacuum with small enough vacuum energy. And B, 
from experiments in our universe, you can in principle see them, make them see them and sort of verify that indeed there are two to the 500 vacua there. Let's say that that happens. We still wouldn't know whether it's realized out there somewhere, there's a multiverse, eternal inflation, all the other crap. We wouldn't know if that happens. But I don't know about you, I would be, I would really think that the, the way I should think about tuning problems would change a lot if I knew for, if I knew experimentally for a fact that there are two to the 500 other vacua out there. Okay. So in this way of thinking, um, uh, these, uh, let's call them landscape sector scalars. The, 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 the like landscape, uh, the, the a, a qualitative prediction of the landscape is, is that there, there should be a few hundred sort of uh, scalars somewhere uh, whose, uh, whose many minima gives us the exponentially largest number of vacua we need. Um, uh, so most of the people imagine these things are all very, very heavy, but we're going to now imagine that some part of the landscape sector is light, okay? Uh, in fact, going to be super light. Um, uh, uh, and so that's what we're gonna call low, low energy landscape. So, so here's the picture. So we're going to imagine that there's some part of a landscape which is heavy, and that has like lots of vacua, but not 10 to the 120. Let's say it has a moderate number of vacua. Just pick a number, 10 to the 70 vacua. Okay. So, so there are these very heavy scalars. These very heavy scalars move around. The cosmological constant changes. Those heavy scalars couple to Higgs masses. Maybe one Higgs, two Higgses. Okay, it couples to them. Um, and, uh, and so all these parameters change, but there's like 10 to the 70 vacua. In those 10, 10 to the 70 vacua, the cosmological constant changes, the Higgs masses change, but 10 to the 70 is not a big enough number to find a vacuum with a small enough cosmological constant for our world, okay? So, so this sort of heavy landscape uh, just doesn't have enough vacua. But we're now going to imagine that there's N other scalars, this uh, uh, the, in blue here, and that these guys have a Z2 symmetry on them. Okay, so these scalars do have degenerate minima like this. Okay, and there's there's n sub i of these guys. Now, now what is the picture for the number of vacua? Well, because of the Z2 symmetry, uh, I have two to the n vacua, but they're exactly degenerate because of there's a uh, Z2 symmetry. So even though I have many, many more vacua, I have 10 to the 70 vacua here. Um, I have two to the NA vacua here. So I have, let's say 10 to the 70 here. I, the total number of vacua is 10 to the 70 times this two to the NI, but it doesn't matter. It's not still not helping me find a vacuum with small enough vacuum energy because they're all degenerate, okay? The only way I could use these to, uh, the only way I could use these other vacua to kind of uh, help scan more finely to find uh, a small cosmological constant is if I break the Z2 symmetry here. I'm gonna break the Z2 symmetry there uh, uh, spontaneously by coupling these scalars phi to uh, my two exhibit model, to uh, H1, H2. So I'm going to, there's an overall small coupling epsilon. And then, um, and then uh, so that, that epsilon is a weak coupling that goes along with all the couplings of the phi. So these phi's are ultra weakly interacting ultra light things. Epsilon is a measure of the shift symmetry breaking on these scalars. So it's a very tiny uh, coupling. And on top of that, there's some parameter kappa that controls the uh, strength of the coupling to a Higgs as, as well. So there's sort of two small couplings here. Epsilon, which is really super duper tiny and kappa that could be you know, 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two, some, some uh, uh, smaller coupling, okay? So the whole model still has a Z2 symmetry, but now crucially the point is that if H1, H2 is triggered, then I can then I actually break the Z2 symmetry on these scalars and I can I can tilt this potential. Okay, so so let's draw the picture here. So um, let's imagine what happens when the uh, expectation value of uh, of H1, H2. Sorry, th th this really should have been expectation value of H1, H2. Let's see what it happens in the, uh, um, uh, if the expectation value is zero, I have these two to the n minima uh, degenerate and nothing is happening. When this expectation value, H1, H2 uh, grows, then, uh, then I split these two to the n minima. Now these guys are no longer uh, degenerate. So, so I split them, so I start getting, uh, so, so, I, uh, so I now have lots of extra vacua with small splittings between them. 
That's good. But now what happens when the Higgs expectation values get way too big, when they get too big, I tilt this potential so much that instead of having two vacua, I just have one vacuum and I go back to not having all the vacua uh, I need anymore. So the picture is I start off with uh, not enough vacuum for the cosmological constant. As I turn on uh, the expectation values H1, H2, I split them further and then I manage to find vacuum with small enough cosmological constant. But as I make the expectation value too big, they all collapse again and I can't make any anymore. So the only way to find vacuum with small enough cosmological constant is for the expectation value of H1, H2 to lie in a range. And, uh, and so uh, so that forces us to tune M1 squared and M2 squared to be, uh, uh, to be negative, but not too negative. Again, if they're too negative, we lose the uh, two minima and we go back to just having one vacuum and not small enough uh, uh, CC. So if I sort of plot in this, um, uh, if I plot as a function, uh, mu squared is the expectation value of H1, H2, um, this is a sort of qualitative picture. If I look at the tiniest cosmological constant that I can get in this extended landscape, the tiniest cosmological constant uh, uh, that I can get. Uh, naively, you would think that um, that uh, in the as I'm scanning around in the big landscape, maybe both Higgs mass squares are near the cutoff. Then that means that I can use all the vacuum I have to make the cosmological constant small. Then naively, you think that if you tune down the Higgs mass squares. You have fewer vacuum left, so the tiniest cosmological constant that you can get would get bigger. That's exactly what we see in this plot. Okay, so as I make, uh, as I make, uh, the, uh, as I tune down the, the Higgs mass squares, uh, the smallest cosmological constant that I get actually gets bigger because I don't have as much tuning uh, uh, available uh, as I had before. But until I get to this window, um, this is the window where the splittings that I induce start. Uh, between the different vacuums start overlapping with each other. Uh, and now all of a sudden I have access to two to the N new vacua. So, so in this regime, this drops by a factor of two to the N. Uh, and so I can get a much, much smaller uh, cosmological constant until finally mu squared gets, uh, uh, gets too large. And when it gets, uh, uh, when it gets, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, until it gets, uh, uh, and yeah, and then when, when it gets too large, I go back down again to, um, uh, to uh, yeah. Uh, when it gets, uh, when it gets too, too big, I go back down again um, uh, because I can't, uh, I can't, um, uh, again, uh, I lose my two different minima uh, and, uh, and, um, and I, I, I once again can't find enough vacua. Uh, to make a small cosmological constant. Okay, so 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 this rough scaling one over mu to the fourth is what you would have expected without uh, without this extra landscape. If you didn't have this extra light landscape, that would have just been one over mu to the fourth. The the mu to the fourth is that there's naively a tuning of one over mu squared and one over mu squared for each one of uh, for bringing the uh, m m one squared and m two squared to to a tuning them down to the scale of mu. Uh, and so the actual CC that you would uh, have would scale like one over mu to the fourth. Um, but, uh, uh, but because of this extra uh, landscape sector, uh, uh, we get access to all these different vacua in a range. And that's where, um, that's where we're forced to live uh, in order to find a vacuum with a small enough cosmological constant. Okay, so, so that's the, that's the uh, picture, um, is that we couple the operator H1, H2 to this uh, landscape sector, you know, hundreds of very light uh, scalars, and the presence of that coupling um, uh, uh, makes it possible. If the Higgses are tuned down, it makes it possible to find enough vacua to make a small cosmological constant. So in this way, you correlate the smallness of the cosmological constant with the smallness of the Higgs mass. And uh, so another um, uh, qualitative uh, uh, cosmological consequence of this. Is that we have you know hundreds of these ultralight scalars. Uh, there are some bounds and signals from long range forces, but uh, typically these couplings are so small that even long long range forces aren't. Uh, 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 you don't really get uh, observable signals even for uh, futuristic experiments unless you're very optimistic. Um, 
But uh, another qualitative point is that these five are, tr uh, are displaced by electroweak symmetry ranking. Um, and the coherent oscillations of phi's uh, could be uh, uh, dark matter as a very conventional picture for, uh, for uh, ultralight uh, uh, coherent oscillating dark matter, except with their, again, the sort of novelty here is that there are naturally um, hundreds of them. Okay. So um, yeah, anyway, so this is a, it's a, it's a totally different uh, uh, thing from the first part of the talk, but if I summarize the, the most interesting aspect is, is uh, A, uh, just to say it quickly again, um, uh, there's just this qualitative idea, uh, what is it that cares about the Higgs mass squared parameters? And uh, are there any local operators that care about them? And in the standard model, the answer is almost none except the glue glue dual operator. Um, and uh, uh, beyond the standard model and two exemplar models uh, with this very, very special uh, it's very simple, it's all trivial, but very simple um, uh, charge assignment um, with the, uh, with the uh, Z4 symmetry, the Z4 PQ symmetry and B equals zero with the PQ only broken by the quartic coupling. Um, that makes it possible for the H1, H2 operator to be triggered. And, uh, and I think the most interesting thing is that that's a corner of the two exoplanet model, which is very dangerous, but uh, impossible to decouple the states but still not excluded experimentally and a fantastic target for the high luminosity run uh, as well as potentially for Higgs factories. So that's, a, that's, a, that's one, one just fact. And then uh, we can use this sort of module, this fact that the H1, H2 can be used as a trigger um, can be used in, in some cosmological scenarios. And I gave you an example where the fact that H1, H2 is, is a trigger uh, could be used to correlate the, uh, uh, the hierarchy problem and the cosmological constant problem. So that uh, the only way to get a small enough cosmological constant is to fine tune, not just one Higgs, but two Higgs down to the weak scale. Uh, and to uh, force this operator H1H2 to uh, uh, turn on. Okay. I think that was a little bit longer than I promised, but uh, uh, that, was, uh, um, uh, that was the second part of the talk. Can I ask you something else? Just your sure. feeling. On the basis of what you said in the previous part, would you conclude that supersymmetry is not needed anymore? It may be needed for strings, but not for the standard model somehow. Well, I mean, uh, I, think, I think that uh, uh, what, what I, my, my view about supersymmetry is what I said at the, at the very start, that uh, I, I think, and I, I, I still think that, uh, that some picture uh, like, like uh, uh, minimal split Susie uh, looks good to me. Um, uh, you know, it could be that we need supersymmetry for various ultraviolet reasons. Okay, um, uh, maybe it's just there. Uh, you know, even if uh, even if there, I mean, it could be there for reasons that have to do with uh, ultimately stability of the vacua and the landscape, something like that. Okay, but um, uh, however, um, it's always been true from the top down that when when you tried to build theories to break supersymmetry, it was always the case that it was harder. To uh, to give the uh, the fermions mass and scalar. So yes. many of the simplest models of Susie breaking have the splitting in the spectrum, but the scalar is heavier than the uh, fermions. And it was only the desire for complete naturalness that put them on 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 top of each other. So you have to sort of make the models a little bit more complicated in order to make them totally natural. So of course, if you think there's only one vacuum in the world and uh, you know everything should be perfectly natural, then of course you would do that. But if you think there is something like, like the landscape, then it's not at all inconceivable that supersymmetry will actually just break in the more generic way. And that there's a little bit of uh, uh, tuning, which is maybe forced because, you know, there, just like there are, there's Weinberg's argument for the cosmological constant, there are reasonable anthropic arguments for the, for the, for the weak scale, right? You know, that, uh, that if the Higgs valve gets bigger by a factor of two or three, we lose atoms, uh, you know, there, there, there's, yeah. a, there's a number of arguments like that. Now it's not as dramatic as the cosmological constant, but the degree of tuning we're talking about is also not as dramatic. It's like, you know, part in the, you know, in many split, we're talking about tuning the part in 10,000, part in 100,000, part in a million. Um, it sounds like a lot, but relative to the 10 to the 90, it isn't, it isn't anything, okay? Um, and that was the sort of heresy of split. That's why people hated it uh, uh, for a while. Um, uh, is that they said, oh, come on, the whole point of supersymmetry is that we, we don't want to 
tuned. We want it to be natural. It's nice thing. It's super symmetric and tuned. Um, and that was always the attention is that you could think, well, either there's anthropic, blah, 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 but then that means the standard model and nothing else up to the Planck scale, or it's natural and it's easy and so on, right? Um, that was always the uh, dichotomy. And what the landscape makes at least possible is that you can actually have both. And it's not crazy to have both from this uh, point of view. So that's sort of my attitude. It's sort of from the top down, we expected this loop factor anyway, and now, where do we need the fermions? Well, we, we need them to be where they are uh, uh, from the simplest picture of WIMPs. And then you would expect the scalars to be at 100 or 1,000 uh, GeV, uh, uh, TeV. And then FCNCs are gone. The EDM problems are gone. The moduli problems are gone. All those problems are gone. But gauge coupling unification is still there uh, because the scalars are never needed for gauge, gauge, gauge coupling unification. So um, that's my, my attitude. I think supersymmetry has a purpose in life. I think uh, this, these, um, I, I always say what I like about mini split is that all the indications from the last sort of 40 years about the, the opposing indications, uh, the hints from my nature about physics beyond the standard model, um, they all make sense in this picture. I mean, none of them are red herrings. They all have their purpose in life. Um, both the fact that on the one hand, Unification of couplings in dark matter is fantastic, but why we haven't seen any of the signals? Why did none of the dogs bark from FCNCs and EDMs and so on? And I think this is a picture in the world where all those things make make sense. I mean that that uh, um, uh, so uh, so that's 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 how I think think about things. Now it could be though that, but at the most sort of hard nosed level. Um, uh, all, all, all of this connection to the landscape and so on did was make more plausible, you know, something you could have said even without it, right? We don't need all that motivation. We can just say, take Susie, push the scales up to a, a, a hundred or a thousand TeV and see, see, see what you get. It's interesting that from this point of view, you can't push them to 10,000 TeV. You really can only push them, you know, not much heavier than hundred or a thousand TeV because the heat map starts getting too heavy. Yes. Okay, so that's another thing which comes comes along for the ride nicely here, right? When we push them, starting at 30, at 30 TV up to 1,000 TV, the Higgs mass goes from 120 to 1, 135 or so, right? So, so we can't even, uh, yeah, so we can't, um, uh, we can't push the scalars too heavy, um, even from that sort of bottom-up uh, point of view. So I think that if this hint of gauge coupling unification is not a complete accident and, uh, and for, you know, it might be a complete accident, of course, but we have so few hints in physics beyond the standard model. I don't think we can, we can, uh, it's a, uh, it's not prudent to throw out the hints that we do have. If we take that as a serious hint, I think supersymmetry has some role uh, in the physics between here and the gut scale, and it can't be too far away. And the picture of mini split, I think uh, the only thing that it does is force you to make this 45 degree rotation and you're thinking about uh, tuning. But that's kind of there anyway. That's there anyway because of the CC and is made perhaps more, more plausible by the existence of a landscape. Um, but it would still mean that, uh, yeah, that perfect naturalness is not there. However, we would have to see the electroweekinos and the gluinos uh, certainly by, by 100 TV collider, no, 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 no doubt. So that's another aspect of it, which I think is interesting. I mean, those of us who've been, uh, many of us who've been talking about 100 TV colliders uh, certainly, whenever I, I talk about it, um, I say nothing about uh, kind of model motivations. Um, it's all about the properties of the Higgs. And I think that's what it should be. Um, we should not, uh, you know, we should not say that we're building a machine to discover this, that, and the other uh, when we don't know that they're there. But having said that, it is not true, at least from my point of view, that it's a completely random fishing expedition that we have absolutely no reason to expect that there is something out there, you know, the next decade beyond there. It's not true, we do have reason. Um, and these models like split were being talked about you know, long before the LHC. So this is not something that we just invented after the LHC, oh, we changed the goalposts, we changed our mind. No, we were saying these things well before the LHC. And well before the LHC, there were sort of pictures of the world where it was very plausible the LHC would not see things, but the sort of decade after that would. And so I think, uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's my, my, my rough picture of the world about uh, about uh, about Susie. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Nice question. I, uh, 
So I asked the same question to Hyungdo, but uh, I, I was satisfied by his answer. Okay. So, so you, your, your model for this uh, simple uh, double X, uh, uh, two X sub, uh, double M model is very interesting, but uh, uh, it, it does have a, 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 cosm a, a domain wall problem when, when H2 gets bad, right? No, that, that, that's actually really, really cool. Yeah, we, we, we uh, I think uh, um, uh, we'll, uh, I can't remember if it's been updated on the archive or, or not yet. We had a discussion about this uh, uh, a little while ago. It's actually very nice the way it works. There is no, there is no domain wall problem. The reason is the following. Um, uh, the Exactly this coupling to the landscape sectors breaks uh -huh. the Z2 symmetry. It gives you an effective B term. You mm -hmm. see, I have these phi H up, H down. Right? Uh, uh, these phi are very, very light scalars. And so the expectation value of the phi gives you an effective B term. It's tiny, but it gives you an effective uh, B term for this, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, two-edged doublet model. And that effective B term is big enough to, uh, to uh, uh, accelerate the domain walls and have, them, uh, and have them annihilate each other so that you don't have any problems. Still, you have a, a stable uh, a BEV for H1 times H2? Yeah, that's right. There, there, there's a BEV for H1 times H2. So, so let, let, let's, let's back up a second. Imagine that we have the two exoblet model, but I did have a non zero B term. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then what that means is that, uh, uh, is that uh, I, I have the uh, two uh, minima that are, uh, that are related by the Z2, but now the B term gives a tiny uh, energy difference between them. And that means that the domain wall moves, right? So, that, that, so now, you know it very well. You, you need a tiny pressure on this domain wall in order to clear them out of, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to clear them out and have them all bang into each other and uh, annihilate. Um, so, uh, so, so, so tip, I mean, this is not what we're using here, but just to remind you in generic uh, uh, Z2 breaking things, even operators suppressed by the Planck scale uh, dimension five operators suppressed by the Pratt scale are enough to move the walls, uh, to, to, to uh, sweep them out through uh, um, uh, in a time of order Hubble and have them all annihilate so you don't have any uh, uh, domain walls anymore. And uh, anyway, you can work it out here and, uh, and, the, and the effective B term, which is actually present by the fact that those fives uh, have a VEV, uh, uh, means that the, uh, means that, uh, that the, uh, that the, pressure difference between the different sides of the wall are easily big enough to have them all uh, uh, go away. Is, is it clear what I'm saying? That, uh, that like literally uh, this, this coupling, uh, literally this uh, coupling, phi, um, remember uh, we needed this, uh, I can't have a hard B term, BH1H2, I can't have that because, because I would close the loop and that would ruin the, the uh, mechanism, okay? However, I have this coupling epsilon phi i h one h two. This preserves the uh, z two symmetry, so all, all the symmetries are fine. This thing is still not there, but the phi's have these very shallow potentials, and the phi's are are displaced from their minimum. In fact, the, the phi's are coherently oscillating today to be dark matter. Even if they weren't coherent, not oscillating, they have a broken. Uh, uh, this Z2, this is now this is the phi potential. Um, uh, the whole point is that they have a potential that looks like this. So so even if they were here at the minimum today, uh, that would that would give me an effective B term. So there's some effective B, which is this epsilon times the sum uh, of all these five, or the sum of epsilon i phi i. Okay, um, there's some scale here. Uh, there's some scale. If this is scales to m star, anyway, there's some there's some overall m star in front of the whole thing. Um, uh, 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 so this is something of order epsilon m star squared. And when you look at all the uh, parametrics of this model, so um, that 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 means that uh, if I now look at the uh, uh, the Higgs domain wall, there's a domain wall here. It has a tension of order v cubed. Um, but there's a pressure difference between the uh, sides of the wall, uh, which is of order of this epsilon uh, uh, m star squared v squared. And if you look at the uh, parameters, this pressure is easily big enough that all the walls uh, annihilate. 
and uh, you never get into a regime where they uh, dominate the energy. Okay, I okay, got that makes sense. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, are there further questions or comments? One question to the first part of the talk, but I think also partially to the second part of the talk. Yeah. So um, as uh, Professor Hong pointed out, if you change the RGEs, does this have an effect on inflation or Higgs inflation models? And uh, also in the second part of the model, uh, or in the second part, uh, you were discussing the zero temperature vacuum now. But yeah. uh, if you go to, to finite temperature, um, does this change uh, inflation in a way, or do I get constraints from? No, uh, from no. I, 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 for the for the for the first part, it's an it's an interesting question. I think um, I think uh, I mean. Very naively, I would say the following: that if there's anything like the picture that we're that that that, that I'm talking about, uh, again, since we don't have a very con concrete picture for it, this is this is kind of extrapolating on a speculation. But roughly, it looks like the RGs would get even sort of flatter, right? And that goes in the direction of making Higgs inflation easier. So uh, that that's that's the point, right? And Higgs inflation, you're trying to leverage the fact that uh, that there that there's a place where the beta function is very very flat. So you might think that that would make uh, that some picture like that would make Higgs inflation easier. Um, so that's uh, one comment uh, for the first part. Uh, for the second part, no, no. I, the, 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 essentially, I mean, um, uh, for all intents and purposes, as far as the like early universe cosmology is concerned, uh, it's just like a, any old two exoplanet model. Um, uh, the of course, there's the high temperature effect and potential. All that stuff is is the same as a standard. These little landscape sectors are just extremely weakly coupled. To the uh, to the uh, Higgses, um, uh, <clears throat> but it's just that their 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 presence is there to ensure just that uh, in you know uh, in in different in different passes of the universe on huge scales the phi's would be in different places, uh, and that the two to the n choices for where they could be allow you to scan enough places to find one with a small uh, cosmological constant, but. Um, once you're in the one which has a small cosmological constant, which is ours, the sort of actual dynamics of the early universe and so on is not really affected by them, other than, you know, a kind of a conventional picture where they coherently oscillate, it could be dark matter and, 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 and things like that. But they're very, very weakly coupled dots. I see. So um, inflaton decay into those fields would... Do you need this or uh, is this? No, 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 we don't know. Th th those fields don't need to be reheated at all. In fact, uh, really they're very light scalars. And so it's a usual kind of picture when you have very light scalars, wherever wherever they were during inflation, you know, they're just moving around, they have very flat potentials, but they get stuck. Uh, and then, and then uh, eventually when Hubble gets small enough, they start rolling and their oscillations can be uh, dark matter. But no, they don't need to be produced uh, as particles by the inflaton. We just need to have them as sort of the, in the usual sort of condensate way, the way you think about axions or whatever. Like when we talk about axion dark matter, the axions don't have to be produced by the decay of the inflaton. They're just there. They're, they're you know, the, 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 the axion as a field is just stuck at some, at some value until Hubble drops low enough that they can start oscillating. So it's exactly the same. I see. And if they are produced by uh, inflaton decays, then this is not part of the dark matter, but just some yeah, it's something component. else. That's right. Exactly. It's okay. something else. And the thing is that they will not be produced by the inflaton because the whole point is that they're extremely weakly coupled. They're almost goldstones. They're goldstones except for tiny, tiny couplings. So they can't have big couplings to the uh, inflaton. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah. But even if they were, that would not be the coherent part. There'll be some other part that's, uh, yeah. And, and the coherent part greatly dominates. Thank you. There are more questions. I'm very impressed with all of you guys. You uh, you uh, <laughs> you um, you survived for nearly uh, three hours. Well done. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your wonderful talk and very your nice talk. Session. Yeah.
Oh, I had a terrific time, guys. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Francesca, for giving me the opportunity to clap and uh, <laughs> continue. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. Bye-bye. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye